Welcome back to Season 5 of Porcelain Peak, your favorite strange and scary podcast featuring chop talk, trivia, deep dive main discussions into the odd and unusual, and the return of Final Cut. Oh, shit. And I mean, I, I would say that this is probably like, you know my fifth or sixth favorite of, of podcasts that do this kind of thing. Um, I, I wouldn't rank us that high. But yeah, um, uh, if you're on Instagram and you're following us, then you know that we've already done this episode. We have already done this episode. So if, wah, our, wah. if our discussion feels like it's missing anything, um, some oomph, some oomph uh, that's because we're Groundhog Daying it several days later. And we're, um, we're, I'm hoping that because we've had a few days in between and we have new news, and we got a little extra special final cut, like you mentioned. Yeah, stabby, stabby. Uh, I'm hoping this will be a better episode than the one that now only exists in our memories. <laughs> <laughs> in our imagination. Yep. And the we that he is referring to are your three hosts. Me, Tone. Uh, what did I call you last week? The Jode oh, Warrior. Faustin. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this week, uh, you're going to be owing me some lost time. <laughs> <laughs> and Anthony. And uh, yes, we are talking about Mad Max 2, The Road Warrior, and we're going to do Scream 6 for our final cut. So if that interests you, then stay tuned. And if not, then turn the volume down, let it play in the background. And we'll get started with Chop Talk. Pick. Why don't you take an axe and chop it open? Well, before we get to that new news, like mm-hmm. you mentioned, mm-hmm. how are you fellas? It's... Uh, Oscar Sunday, a little peek behind the curtain. Yeah, it's going to yeah. be a uh, quick turnaround time. Yes, <laughs> for you. Good job. Yeah, <laughs> good job in in future. Yeah, um, I am uh, feeling slightly under the weather. I think I think uh, the allergies got me. I think the valley is feeling slightly under. The yeah, weather. I was going to say. I think I, we all true, are. <laughs> very fair. Oh. Yeah, yeah. You probably can't hear it on this recording, but it is fucking pouring cats and dogs. Out there, literally, I was picking up DVD copies of the movie Cats and Dogs <laughs> as I walked in. Um, but yeah, I mean, outside of the weather, just getting me so, so down and so depressed. Um, mm. I am excited for today because it is a big day. We got this to knock out and shoot your guys' way. And then we personally are going to be having fun with the Oscars, having a little uh, friendly competition. Might be crowning a new... Emily Sashin Gainer champion. I mean, it's been and still for the the perpetuity of that award, but um, hopefully an and new will happen tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like maybe uh, maybe I regret that we invented that award because I don't think I've ever won it. <laughs> <laughs> like I take I take back every bit of energy I've given you, Emily and Sh- Sashin Gainer. Um, but yeah, you guys, uh, how are you doing? I'm pretty good. I was at a conference for the last three days, and so it feels really good to be home. I was down in Long Beach hoping that the weather would be better. Uh, it was Thursday when I got there, so that was super nice, but then Friday, Saturday was kind of shit again. How was uh, the flight? Not bad. I haven't flown in like 10 years, I think, so I was like, this is weird since that Europe trip. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, and so I was like, I don't know what the protocols are. Like, what can I bring? What can I take? So I just didn't bring. How many anything. guns can I bring <laughs> onto the plane? <laughs> uh, my bag got flagged and security in Oakland. Like, we got we to check it again. And I was like, oh, fuck. Like, what now? It was clothes, toiletries, and shoes. And I was like, what happened? It's very stressful. That's like, I love actually flying. Like, I love being on the plane, especially if I have, like, good movies to watch or something. Mm-hmm. And I like the feeling in my tummy of being in the air. Um, but the whole airport and TSA and all that stuff gives me so much fucking anxiety that I have like had many, many nightmares about being right, like, at 20, like feet. yeah, nightmares <laughs> at 20,000 feet. No, no, it's all, it's always on the ground. And it's like the, the Tom Hanks terminal movie where I'm just like trapped inside of the airport. <laughs> I, uh, I got to sit at the window and then right at the wing. And I was like, "Oh shit, where's the gremlins?" So you were like, "Oh, I'm on scout duty. Like, I, I got, I got to be watching these wings." I got to, yeah, which we'll tie into our trivia later. But anyway, we Wanna got some news. some news. Yeah. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is real quick cover the news that we already talked about uh, in our previous recording of this that I think is important for us to touch on again. Um, so I mentioned to you guys last time that Flanagan recently did an interview where he stated that he has a pretty dope idea for a new nightmare on elm street 
um, or as as I like to call it, the haunting on Elm Street. Um, <laughs> or you and, call it a new new nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> that the newest, new new the newest nightmare. Yeah, and um, basically the extent of what he said about it was, I have a really great pitch, and my agents have no idea who I should pitch it to because the rights are such a mess. Um, it is apparently. Well, I looked into this a little bit because you had some questions. So I guess the Craven Estate owns the U.S. rights to Nightmare on Elm Street, and then I think it's Warner Brothers, a different studio, owns the rights for international distribution of A Nightmare on Elm Street. And then getting to the end of the nitty-gritty of like Nightmare on Elm Street versus the rights to Freddy Krueger, I don't know if there's some distinction there like there is for Jason, where it's like, oh, you can use Jason, but you can't use Friday the 13th, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's pretty much all we know about it. People are already putting together some uh, spooky blue-hued fan posters of what they (laughs) they want uh, this to look like, but... Um, yeah, I mean, it would be exciting if it would happen, but I think we mentioned previously, he's a very busy man. He's potentially got that Dark Tower shit coming up. He's got, uh, what's the fucking House of Usher. Yeah. House of Usher. If anyone could pull it off, though, I mean, it's Flanagan. If anyone could pull me off, it'd be Flanagan, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Eee, she, take it up with uh, Kate Siegel. Making it a movie. I, I, it's, like I, it's been a minute. Yes, but also I want him to release those fucking script books that he makes. Yeah. The screenplay books with the art and all that shit in there. I'm like... Every time I see a TikTok way. and see like his house and all the shit that he has, like the collectibles and things. I'm like, you just adopt me? Must be nice being a rich horror nerd. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the other bit of repeating news from last week uh, was that Blumhouse and James Wan's company, uh, Blum Monster, Atomic House, whatever, <laughs> um, is making a Dead by Daylight movie. Um, some people are already annoyed about this because it seems like the new trend is let's turn all of the survival horror games into movies. They should do that Friday the 13th game. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, they should do a Resident Evil movie. (laughs) (laughs) They've never done that before multiple times. Hey, uh, now that The Last of Us has been like a really big hit TV show, they should make a video game about that. That would be perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Corridor Digital just came out with a video that I think was them trying to throw some of the heat off of them from their anime rock, paper, scissors Uh, video. I saw. So I love Corridor Crew, and as soon as that video dropped and I watched it, I was like, you guys are fucked. This is going to be bad for you. Yeah. Why would happen? So they, um, there's this big thing going around with AI art where, um, you plug in all of these things from the internet to give to the AI for it to recreate an art format, um, which is, you know, it's very tenuous at best whether or not they have the rights to any of the things that are happening, what actual artists who make actual art they're ripping off. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like, it's a very gray area. And apparently they fed it a ton of, a ton of like footage from like a popular anime. Vampire Hunter D. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I think Sarah's talked about that. Yeah. So <clears throat> most, pretty much all artists are unanimously like AI is, is stealing our work. It's st- literally stealing our work to, for inspiration, but also stealing, you know, people are going to stop paying us because they're just going to be like, I can use AI to make whatever it is I need to make. So really shitty for artists. Some big uh, name artists, I think Ralph Bakshi, like came out and was like, "Fuck this," basically. So Corridor, who usually is very, very good about like doing the animators react and stunt women react and all this stuff and showing like you know representing all of the underdogs of the industry, they put out a video that was like, "We're just gonna shoot ourselves in front of a green screen and then rotoscope." AI animate it to look like Vampire Hunter D anime. Mm -hmm. They put it out and pretty much mostly Twitter, but you know, a large vocal uh, minority of people are like, fuck these guys. I'm unsubscribing. Like you have betrayed our trust like by making this. And um, so then they put out a video the other day that was like, what if the last of us TV show was a video game? And then they like jokingly put that kind of like AI filter over it Mm -hmm. and just made it look like the video game. And everybody, like, a bunch of people on Twitter were like, fuck these guys, they're doing it again. And, like, not realizing <laughs> that they're trying to make some sort of joke. But yeah, it's a mess. And I feel bad because I, I've been following those guys for years. I love pretty much everything they do. And I'm sure that it was just one of those cases where they got really excited about the technology and didn't quite think through what the reaction from their fan ba- base would be. What they should have done and what has already been in place for other YouTube channels um, is they should have paid an artist they should have paid an artist Mm -hmm. to create stills that they could then teach the ai to to rotoscope with well they have merch now for the rock paper scissors video and it's they in the credits were like you know hand drawn by such and such person and everybody in the comments is like oh so you'll pay an artist to do this 
uh, but you won't pay them to do your videos that are monetized and making a ton of money. And that's the other big thing that people have a problem with is that they're making a bunch of money off of it mm. by using other people's artwork. So, uh, yeah, long tangent off of Dead by Daylight, the movie, but I had never really played the game. I know the bit. We talked last time about how the Friday the 13th game and the Evil Dead game, like this is the new thing is, you know, one the person asymmetrical, plays a, yeah. yeah, one person plays like a powerful killer character and then everybody else is survivors. <laughs> but we'll see. I mean, kind I, of biting the dick off of fucking... Uh, uh, left for dead and yeah and, yeah yeah 100 percent. did you know that blumhouse also does books really yeah i bought a book the other day and i was like this sounds interesting it was called meddling kids and i think it's like scooby-doo s mm-hmm. but then like what if it was real and they were wrong i don't know it's its own thing but anyway i was i was flipping. waiting for a punchline there you were like you're like did you know the blumhouse is doing books i was waiting for there to be some sort of joke yeah, yeah. these nuts <laughs> <laughs> be a book these nuts in your mouth <laughs> anyway they, uh, I was, yeah, I was flipping through it. It said Blumhouse Books, and I was like, "Oh shit, I didn't realize that they did that." That's but cool. That's I know. In. <laughs> I know. Uh, Vinegar Syndrome, who does a lot of like cool uh, releases of horror films and stuff, they're starting a book uh, oh. division too. So kind of weird because for a while there, it was like, "Oh, books are dying," and now all these companies are like, "Well, we're gonna get into books," and yeah. I'm happy about it. That's super cool. Um, so moving on to some other news, uh, Sam Raimi recently did an AMA. Uh, I assume because he's producing 65, the Adam Driver movie that just came out. Um, And somebody asked him about Drag Me to Hell, and he said that Drag Me to Hell 2 is potentially going to happen. Really? Um, Leave great alone. (laughs) Yeah. So basically what he said was the reason it hasn't happened is because the ending of the original is so definitive. Right. that he didn't feel like there was any reason to do another one. Um, and he is not really involved at this point. He just said as if the other creatives at Ghost House, I think his thing is Ghost House Pictures, come up with a good enough idea, then we'll make another one. So he's not saying it's going to happen. He's just saying if there's a good enough idea for why we should continue it. I would just like to see, is it Alison Lohman, the main actress? Yeah. I would just like to see her come back because I don't really think she's been in hardly anything since that movie. Which I can understand because she got a bunch of real maggots spit into her mouth. And I've seen the behind like the scenes yeah. floating around on TikTok. Uh, that and then the ending of the movie has been floating around TikTok a lot recently too, which I'm like, why? Makes sense. People are just like, look how fucked up crazy this is. Yeah. And but, it is. But, but with context. Because the rest of the movie is also fucked up crazy. Yeah. There's a goat that goes like, ha, ha, ha. Um, so I wanted to bring this bit up because we, you've talked about this, uh, in the past with the whole casting people of other ethnicities and, and all that in roles and how the mentality should be if they're a good actor or, you know, the the right for the role. Exactly. Yeah. So there's been a bunch of controversy in the racist side of the internet, um, about the actor, uh, Chuck Woody Iwaji, who was cast as the High Evolutionary in Guardians of the Galaxy 3, uh, is a black man. The character in the comics has been uh, purple most of the time. And people are basically going like, this is a white character and you cast a black person. It's it's DC being woke. And James Gunn has been very active on Twitter and stuff about responding to people. And he was basically like, uh, shut the fuck up with your racist bullshit. I cast the best person for the role. Mm. And that's what I do with all of my roles. And that's why we're not rushing Superman or Batman or any of that. Is he's like, we're going to find the right people for the roles and fuck off with the racist shit. And I was like, good for you, James Gunn. Yeah. And, and purple is not... <laughs> Yeah. One that we subscribe to on Earth, I guess. Yeah, and unless unless your character is like a skinhead Nazi and it's important that they're a white person, like why the fuck does it matter? But Yeah, unless it yeah, unless it yeah, it's significant to the role in some way. Yeah, exactly. Never bothers me, but uh, there's a huge part of the internet that every single little thing bothers them when it's it like comes the to race. So all over. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we could sit here and talk about the concept of white erasure and how it's fucking the dumbest shit I've ever heard in my entire life, but we should move on to the next <laughs> next topic. Just scare tactics to distract you from the fact that uh, we're letting all of our kids die in their schools. But anyway, <laughs> um, and then the other small bit of news before the big news that I wanted to get to is that, Ooh. and this is horror related in a way, Bob Odenkirk has confirmed that he is teaming up with a charity called something. I don't know. I don't have it here. But he's teaming up with charity. I think I've heard some of this. To make a, a serious remake of The Room starring him. Where he, okay. where like, he, like where he delivers Sal. it all dead seriously, like as a dramatic performance. And Flanagan and Kate Siegel are both in the movie as characters. Like fuck? in makeup and shit. They did like a cast photo. Yeah. And, yeah. And, oh, so it's like 
happening. Yeah. So it's it's Shit. in production, and yeah, there's going to be. I don't know if it'll be like a theatrical release or if you have to go donate to that charity to see the movie. But I'm fucking on board because that's <clears throat> hilarious, and I love Bob Odenkirk, and also I obviously love Flanagan and Siegel. So I'm very excited to see what they come up with. Um, That'd be cool to see them in something together. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited about it. And then the uh, this is kind of paired news, but the last bit of big news is that once again. Beetlejuice 2 is supposedly going into production. Uh, it's supposed to be going into production in May. Wow. Uh, with both Burton and Keaton returning. Okay. The bit of news that solidifies this for me and makes me think it's for sure happening now is that Jenna Ortega is in talks to play Lydia's daughter. Mm. So on the one hand, I'm like, that totally makes sense because Burton and Ortega have already worked together. Ortega is a huge name right now. On the other hand, already kind of getting sick of seeing her in literally everything but that's what happened you know but I, I like her so it's no shade against her but it's just like i feel like that happens with this happens with every single like semi-popular actor now is like okay now we're just going to put them in literally everything for two two years until everybody gets sick of them and then they're just going to disappear for a while or like that's what was going on with anya taylor joy Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, still going yeah. on with Anya Taylor Joy. She hasn't gone anywhere. She's she's just, great though. Yeah, yeah, but, but this yeah, thing, she's she, fucking everything. Yeah, and I'm like, I, I I can't really be mad that these people that I like are getting work. Yeah, it's just that I know that for you know, it, it's more a problem with me because I know that I'm going to be that I'm terminally online, so I'm just going to have to continue to see just a million posts of the same thing of they, the same person. Did they say anything about uh, Winona coming back or? No, um, I wouldn't be shocked if she does because she's still, you know, she's had the re- the resurgence with mm-hmm. uh, Stranger Things. I so would love to see Gina Davis back too. I don't know what's going on with Alec, but take him or leave him. Yeah, most people in the comments <laughs> were just like, uh, "Hope Alec Baldwin's not going to be on set for everyone's safety." <laughs> um, no Alec Baldwin, no firearms, please. <laughs> yeah, and that'll be fine. Just be like, "Oh, his ghost moved on to <laughs> to the, the next plane," but. Uh, before we end at Chop Talk, I did have a quick little surprise from my big bag of surprises. But didn't, uh, real quick, didn't they <laughs> announce a Scream 7? Like, is that official? So, it's still not official. The directors of Scream 6 said that they have high hopes that mm. it's going to happen. Um, the box office for the new Scream has been off the chain. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I can only imagine yeah. in the series um, uh, people who cannot reveal their sources have said that rumor is they want to have the, new, the next one shooting by October for a release at the same time next year. Fuck. So it sounds like as long as these just like we were talking about with the Marvel movies, as long as these keep making huge returns, we're going to we're going to slip back into if it's daylight savings time, it must be scream. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and we will we'll reserve our opinions about uh, the movie because we're going to be talking about it at the end of the episode. So Correct. keep an eye out for our final cut. Uh, we'll do what we've been typically doing with new releases, and we'll give you kind of our unspoiler thoughts at the beginning, and then a nice warning, and then we'll yeah. We'll John dive will scream it. at the top of his lungs when it's spoiler six time. six times. Yeah, I'm not going to do any of those things. All right, here's uh, the surprise, baby. So the surprise is uh, we have a couple birthdays. <clears throat> On the podcast. <gasps> very this month. true. What? Very true. So I thought I'd spring a little birthday gift on each of you. Aww. So for tone, related to our news, <laughs> hey! I got you. Drag me to hell. Show them shits the camera, brother. Oh, I don't get to look at it. On V Nail. So if I'm not mistaken, the actual records are like this like fiery only one way to find out yeah <laughs> pop that bad boy open open yeah. her up john it's told me today that you really gotta watch or For listen to your records jigsaw's ladder over here oh i got that the jacob's ladder jacob's ladar you go wax work on both i did go wax work on both yeah, i believe that one has a cool like uh bluish greenish and metal look or something like that if you're not but... on wax work and you're collecting this horror shit so you're missing dumb. out yeah, so because oh, yeah, right. So on. I thought the artwork, like regardless of the music, the artwork was fucking amazing on Let me both get a little of these. Zoom in which on is real quick, part oh, okay. of why I picked them. Yeah. So um, anyone that's listening and not watching, so white, uh, what do they call them? The fold cases. Uh, uh gatefold. gatefold. Gatefolds. Yep. And we got some flames, and we got the old lady on the inside. We're gonna take the record out now. Black sleeve and. 
Oh, yeah. Very Halloween-y. Oh, yeah. Kind of flame. Orange mixed with uh, little black sprinkles. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, I saw a video the other day. I'm sure you guys have seen them of how they make the records where it's just like a little ball. ball, And then they like sprinkle on the different colors and stuff. And then just like, boop, <laughs> smash, smash it. But yeah, since John was the one who introduced us to Jacob's Ladder, I thought that was very appropriate. It is one of my favorites. Well, thank you. Yeah. It was really great. Happy birthday, my buddies. I was like, this isn't a difficult um, shopping trip for me. I'm just going to go <laughs> to the website where you guys are literally always sending me shit from. <laughs> that we're right. on I'll at give least you weekly. <laughs> a little preview of what I got going on here. We've obviously got the artwork here on the front and on the back. Um, the gatefold is like a white uh, and then like a raven's color. Ravens. Ooh. Oh. And the inside artwork is pretty neat. Got like a like a surgery room. It's kind of a little bit of a spoiler if you if you haven't oh, yeah. seen the movie. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'll show you guys over here. Oh, I love when they do those oh, where it's like a whole God. scene. Like you could just open that up and just get a frame for it, and yeah, it would be sick. That is cool. All right, let's see if we can get the actual. Oh, easy, easy. I'm going as That's easy as tight. I can. The only time that I've been pretty disappointed, or that I've been a little bit disappointed with some of their product was my scissor hands one. It was like so tight in the fold I, or in the sleeve, I could not get it out like easily. Let's see if you can see the marbling there. Yeah, there what we is go. It, is it black? It's no, so it's, it's ladder uh, colored. Yeah, so it's like <laughs> so it's like a like a gray silverish with like some like gold oh, in there. Okay. If you kind of yeah. move it around. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you guys like them, and um, yeah, they're dope. That I don't have to carry them around anymore. Well, thanks, man. Thirty-four yeah. never looked so tired. Once again, have, <laughs> <laughs> once again having to reschedule this episode worked out in our favor because I was able to. I think I got those like two days ago, yeah. so I was able to bring them on and show them off. So yeah, that's all I got for Chop Talk. Right on. That sounds good to me. We hope that you enjoyed that news and our beautiful description of our records. <laughs> uh, but we'll go ahead and move into trivia. That Christmas house of wax, the fog of piranha. Before we get started with Trivial Pursuit Horror Movie Edition, we had a bonus question from last week. It was, which famous Twilight Zone episode did George Miller remake for the Twilight Zone movie? Anthony, you said Nightmare at 20,000 feet. And John, you said the Penny one or some shit. Yeah, it was the one with the coin. With the right, yes. Yeah, so uh, almost, almost needless to say that was incorrect. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but Anthony was correct with Nightmare at 20,000 feet. Yeah, and uh, I don't know if you guys know this. Actually, I do know because it's the same trivia that I brought last week or last time we tried to record <laughs> this. But um, Steven Spielberg saw The Road Warrior, loved it so much that he contacted Miller and said, hey, you want to do a segment on my Twilight Zone movie where John Landis is going to kill some people? <laughs> No, um, it'd be crazy if that's how he pitched it. <laughs> no, so what actually happened, and I didn't mention this last time, and I think it's you know all things considered, um, cool thing for George Miller to do. When that ha shit happened, he basically was like, "I'm not working on this movie anymore." And they had already filmed his segment, but they hadn't edited it. So, I'm, so Joe Joe Dante, who had done the previous segment, had to come Dante, in and do all Joe, the editing on it because Miller was like, "I'm not having anything to do with this project after what happened." Good for him. And Spielberg and Landis uh, like immediately stopped being friends after that. Like it was, it was. Bad. Yeah. But anyway, Real bad. whole different subject. All right. So then your question <clears throat> this week, and I guess now would be the time to change your guesses. Uh, so there was going to be a Mad Max TV show, and it was reported that a, or sorry, who was reported to be the favorite for the lead role of Max? So I don't remember what my guesses were last time, but I know what my guess was as soon as I left, which is David Duchovny. Okay. My other maybe guess would be like John Old Depp, maybe, but I I have, a, have no clue. I have a, a guess that I feel like is better than my guess would have been when we originally you mean attempted where you to just record went, this. Uh, <laughs> <Math> <laughs> yeah. My my brain is in a better better headspace. Yeah, like in my head. Um, so I'm gonna go with Keanu Reeves. Okay. There you go. Those are the guesses. And yeah. I will let you know. 
I'll let you guys know as soon as we're done. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. Yeah, to me, d- <laughs> <laughs> to me, uh, Duchovny just it dawned on me. I was like, oh, he was like, you know, on the X Files, and he kind of has a Mel Gibson look, and also he was up for literally everything and just never got any roles. <laughs> so <laughs> cool. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. We will read a category, then go around in a circle reading the questions to each other with me to Foster, Foster to Anthony, and Anthony back to me. And we'll get started with Monster. Monster. Freaking bats. Yeah. So technically, I guess Anthony's on a streak, even though in the one we lost, I did win that. But yeah, who's we, to say? sure who's you to did. Say? Sure you won. <laughs> yeah, Jonathan Majors hopped in and pruned that timeline. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he didn't want that. If I w- if I would have won trivia, the world would have destroyed. <laughs> John, in what country? Is Ginger Snaps set from 2000? I believe it is set in Canada. Oh, Canada. Yeah. That is correct, sir. On the board. I'll take it. Good start. Anthony, in Frankenstein from 1931, what is the first name of Dr. Frankenstein? Ooh. <clears throat> this is tough because in the book... I know it's Victor, but I know in some of the movies, he's Henry. Like, they switch his friend name to his name, mm-hmm. and so I'm not sure what they do for... From what year? 31. Okay, so yeah. So the, the Browning? Yeah, I'm going to go with Henry for the 31 call. version. It's a very good call, because it's the correct answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it was one of those things where they maybe thought... Uh, Victor sounds Victor a little sounds too shitty, evil, yeah. like and too shitty. Which I mean, yeah, that's the character. But <laughs> um, tone in Fright Night from 1985. <laughs> what is the name of the former film star that Charlie comes to for help? Oh man, I think I would have fucked this one up, but I think you've got it. The oh, the former film star. Oh man, I don't know. That Charlie goes to for help. Hit me with your best guess. I'm drawing a blank. The only thing I can think of from that movie is Chris Sarandon. <laughs> so. so so he went to Chris Sarandon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, the answer is Peter Vincent. Oh, yeah. okay. okay. At the end of that movie, uh, he's a crisp Sarandon. All right, moving up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so at the end of round one, John and Anthony got one, and I'm sitting at a goose egg, and we're moving into... The eyeball zone. <laughs> Gore slash disturbing. John in House of a Thousand Corpses from 2003. What is the surname of the monstrous family torturing the protagonists? Oh. I don't remember. Um, Sir Roger Deakins. Sir Ian McKellen. <laughs> oh. I'm, I... This is incorrect. I'm going to say Firefly. That is correct. Okay. Nice. I thought that that was just like a nickname, that they were the Firefly Killers. I didn't know that I, that was I think their... they're the Firefly Clan. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's their actual... Uh, yeah, I guess it's their actual name. They're cool. the Firefly. Yeah, see, I wasn't sure if that was something that maybe got changed between Corpses and Devil's Rejects, and that's like, now they're officially Same. the Firefly family. Same, yeah. Uh, but sometimes the guess works out, right? <clears throat> Anthony, who played the role of Nikki Brand in Videodrome from 1983? He has to remember who Nikki Brand is. <laughs> is this Debbie Harry's character in Videodrome? It is Videodrome, and is that the final answer? Yeah, from Blondie. You are correct. That is exactly what it says in the back. The lead singer of Blondie, Debbie Harry. Love Debbie Harry. Love Blondie. Love Videodrome. Tone. For your eyeballs own question, what horror novelist helped Evil Dead from 1981 acquire a distributor? Stephen King. It is indeed the King, the Kang. Yeah. Stephen King, the Conqueror. I've been doing pretty good with the uh, book-related questions lately. Hey, what do you uh, think? You got a degree in books? <laughs> He's a little pretty good. Well, yeah. So Aaron was texting me about my whole, you know, my whole Tugger situation <laughs> on, on the previous episode, and she was like, "Yeah, why would you bet against Anthony on a on a book question?" And I was like, "Because he, he never have gets them." Good yeah. Track record. It's <laughs> like you would think he would get them, but he never gets them. That's why I gulp was so fucking shocked when you nailed it. So <laughs> I did. All right, cool. That puts me on the board. You guys are still tied. 
side at two, and we're moving into psychological. You are correct. Brainworms. John, Dead of Night from 1945, had how many separate directors? I'm going to say three. Ooh, always off by one. It is four. That, that is, is Alberto Cavalcanti, Charles Crichton, Robert Hammer. That's a cool name. You don't even need a nickname for that guy. Yeah. And then Basil Dearden. Yeah, I've been meaning to check this out because it's show. it's like one of those OG horror anthologies, like oh, old school black okay. and white. Yeah, that makes more sense then. I was like, God, what happened behind those scenes? Yeah, it's yeah. a bunch of people get together in like a house and tell spooky stories. Anthony, in what direction does protagonist Michelle drive at the end of Ten Cloverfield Lane? Baton Rouge to safety or Houston to fight? I'm pretty sure she goes to Houston to fight. That's yeah. the whole bit is that she like uh, gains her. Uh, her own agency by the end and fights the fucking aliens and shit. The man. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You know what I realized last night? Ewan. Is that Nick Offerman is like is like the next John Goodman. Like I feel like they have a very similar vibe. I was because I was watching The Last of Us. I was rewatching it uh, up to, for the finale, uh, which is today. And then, um, oh shit, that's right. Yeah, and then I was watching Speed Racer, which I only got about halfway through before I was like, I can't take this shit anymore. Um, and John Goodman's in it, so I was like, you guys got a very similar vibe. <laughs> anyway, tone for your brain brain worms question in The Invisible Man from 1933. What allows police to discern the location of the Invisible Man? His footprints, his shadow, or his breathe? <laughs> All kinds. <laughs> uh, his his Claire Danes. <laughs> I don't fucking remember. I'll say his footprints. It is indeed his footprints. Okay. Cool. All right. Great. So I got two. You chuckle fucks got three. No. No. no so you got two. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Ooh, right am on. I in the lead? You are in the lead. <laughs> okay. So John and I have two. Anthony's got three. And we're moving into... I forgot which one here. A Star is Born. Paranor- paranormal. <laughs> All right. John, the house in We Are Still Here, 2015, needs fresh souls every how many years? Funeral home. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I'm going to say every five years. The correct answer is 30 years. Uh, Whatever. Close enough. Yeah, close enough. Math is hard. Anthony, in Paranormal Activity from 2007, which character is more frequently off ca- off of the camera, Katie or Mika? That's a, that's a strange question. Um, I feel like it would be Mika because he's behind the camera. Like he's filming shit. So that's going to be my guess. Yeah, is Mika, Mika is correct. That is a weird question. Yeah, but gonna- if you want our opinions on that mm-hmm. movie, John... You can check out our previous episode from mm. Found Footage February, <laughs> where we talk about paranormal activity, amongst other found footage films. Couldn't have said it better myself. Beautiful. Tone, in your Star is Born category, in Insidious, another film we talked about recently, from 2010, Dalton Lambert inherited his ability to astral project from which of his parental figures <laughs> that's a stupid ass question that's a very stupid ass question <laughs> especially for this far into the into the rounds but uh his father it is his father josh lambert portrayed by patrick wilson all right there we go so now i have three john you're still sitting at two mm-hmm. and anthony you're up to four Oh, damn. In things of a sweeper. And we got the hockey round killer. Yep. John, what is the color of the recurring hooded raincoat worn by the killer in Owis, Sweet Owis from 1976? Uh, I believe it is yellow. That is correct. And you're yeah. back in the game. Yeah, yellow like giallo. I was about to say, as the Italians would put it, <laughs> giallo. giallo. Anthony, in House of Wax from 1953, what character creates his wax figures by encasing the cadavers of his victims in wax? Gold. <laughs> <laughs> Insurance money. Um, it's asking for the character's name? Yeah, name and title, apparently. Oh, fuck. 
Uh, it's Vincent Price as uh, Doctor Waxum. <laughs> Dr. Wax Waxum on, Waxen off. Wax off. <laughs> um, I have no clue. So Dr. Waxum off. I'm going to say, yeah, doc, doc, Esquire. <laughs> Dr. Waxen Wax off, Esquire. <laughs> it's Professor Henry Girard. Two Henry questions in one card, man. Weird I don't stuff. Like it. Well, not going to be a sweep, but hopefully I can still keep the win. Queen Tone sweep. in your hockey category. What is the profession of the father of Mark Lewis in <clears throat> Peeping Tom from 1960? Um, he is a director. Ooh, L. Ron Hubbard would hate this character because he's a psychologist. <laughs> That's a little reference to our bonus episode, hey. Battlefield Earth. On the creep hey. cult. Go check that out. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I wish that one would have got lost forever. <laughs> <laughs> that movie, not our episode. Yeah. Cool. Well, that puts me at what? Three? Yep. And I'm. And I'm you're at three. And Anthony's still got four. Yep. And we're moving into international. It was John. a tight game. Tight game. What is the country of origin of the titular bird in The Bird with a Crystal Plumage from 1970? Okay. We've watched this film. This is a hard ass question. I don't like. I wouldn't know that. You even like looking at the answer. I'm like, I don't. Where, it doesn't click any. Where do birds come from? Where do bells? Bart? I'm gonna say Bulgaria. The correct answer is Serbia. Hey, I was somewhere in the a, a area. Serbian a, bird. A Serbian bird. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I'm out, Anthony. What type of supernatural and titties? Are lurking within computer screens in Pulse from 2001. Cairo. Wait, so it, the question is what supernatural entities are in the computers? Entities, yes. <laughs> the entities are in the computer? <laughs> is it asking for something more specific than ghosts? The ghosts Sure of... isn't. Ghosts <laughs> is the answer. I'm not going to let you uh, like outthink yourself on this one. <laughs> yeah, what kind of ghosts are the ghosts in, the, in the ghost computer <laughs> movie? Ghosts! Pretty good movie. Finally checked it out. Yep. I would recommend it. Tone in The Devil's a Backbone from 2001. What type of undischarged weapon rests nose down in the courtyard of the orphanage? A gun? <clears throat> is it one of a specific kind of gun? It. Or is it not a gun? I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> this is your trivia question. A gun. A gun. <laughs> A gun rack. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't have a gun rack for many guns, let alone a gun. <laughs> or, uh, the oh, answer is an undischarged bomb. Oh, a bomb. Yeah. So that was a win for me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, shit. Well, thank God for lost episodes. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Let me get these. Lost episodes and small miracles. Cool. Well, had fun with that. Looking forward to knowing when we're off mic uh, who was supposed to star in that fucking Mad Max TV show. And yeah, if you want more trivia, tune in every week to our show where we talk about trivia. Yep, <laughs> it's trivial. And that is, we're going to take a little break and then we'll get started with our main discussion for March Madness and <laughs> the Road Warrior. Walk away. <laughs> yeah, please I don't am walk away. Humongous. <laughs> Join the creep count. Five dollars a month at patreon.com forward slash porcelain peak for exclusive content, merch discounts, and more. Join the creep count. Five dollars a month at patreon.com forward slash porcelain peak for exclusive content, merch discounts, and more. Hey, you, you want to see something really scary? Welcome back. We're going to get started with our main discussion, a continuation of March Madness. March Madness! <laughs> and we're diving in to Mad Max 2, The Road Warrior, again directed by George Miller and starring Mel Gibson. Womp womp. And this takes place <laughs> three years after the original, and we find Max roaming deeper into the desert. Deeper. <laughs> he comes across a group of bad guys <laughs> and then he comes across a group of good guys and the bad guys want the good guys gas and then max helps them reluctantly <laughs> yeah so um, it's basically the plot of the movie yeah so this is the movie that most people when they think mad max up until probably fury road think of 
Um, and this seems to be kind of what George Miller was trying to do with the first one. He stated in interviews that the first one was a terrible experience for him to make. He did not get final cut or final say on most of it. The budget was obviously really low. So um, he originally was trying to make other movies in between this and then decided, okay, you know what? I'm going to make a second one with a bigger budget and do more of what I want. Shoot it out in the real Outback Outback. Um, surprised we didn't see any kangaroos, you know, getting Kangas, chopped up with I... boomerangs and shit. Um, but yeah, this is where we, we get more of the, uh, the desert wasteland thing. And we talked previously about how I think a lot of people are under the impression that, and maybe because it's from Fallout or things that have been inspired by this, that this is a nuclear apocalypse of some kind. Mm -hmm. At this point in the Mad Max timeline, this is just what society looks like after they got no gas and there's a financial crisis and all this shit. Yeah, there and, was a, a war, I think, with Saudi Arabia and somebody else, which actually took place. And in the movie, that also took place, but instead of it being settled... It just like society collapsed because people just kept talking. Yeah, I'm not doing anything about it. I so think briefly like, touch on that. Yeah, I think the Seven Sisters thing that's on the gas uh, truck or whatever is actually a reference to the real like seven big oil corporations that mm -hmm. like was supposedly controlled the entire oil industry or maybe still do. I don't, I'm not super well versed on mm -hmm. the oil industry uh, except gas is too damn expensive. But um, do we want to do the timeline a bit again? Yeah, we can go a little bit into this because I think it can be confusing for some people. We talked on our previous episode about how uh, disconnected these movies are. There is a bit more of a connection, at least between these first three, than I right. thought there was. So this movie, I compared it to Evil Dead 2 in that it opens with like a quick recap of what happened in the first one. And then is like, cool, now we're getting into the, the new territory and the new shit. Um, yeah, so, so just real quick, the first one takes place roughly um, in like 87 and this is three years later, so maybe around 1990, and society has collapsed. And then shortly after this movie, there is nuclear fallout. And then 15 years later is when 3 takes place, and that's why things are a little bit more strange in that regard. And then Fury Road was supposed to star Mel Gibson and have him be older and in his 50s or, or later – but then he was kind of a fucking shithead. But then he was kind of a dick, and so then they cast it with Tom Hardy being in his 30s, so some of the dialogue and the situations in that don't necessarily make sense, but originally it was supposed to be a continuation of this story and kind of the final send-off of, of Max. Yeah, and Fury Road was originally supposed to be like the end of Max's story. He was supposed to die or have some happy ending at the end. And because they were able to recast with Tom Hardy and realized, cool, we can have at least, you know, three more movies uh, out of this. We'll have him have the classic like wander out into the desert ending, uh, which feels very much like a Western. And that's what I talked about when we discussed this previously is that this movie is straight up just a Western like most most people would call it like a sci-fi western and categorize it that way because yeah it really is max is the clint eastwood uh good bad and the ugly type character you know very uh few lines i think he has like 16 lines in the movie and two of them are i'm just here for the gas um which is what i say whenever i order from taco bell <laughs> um but yeah so he has very few lines he is pretty apathetic to what's going on in the world and he's just like i just need gas and my car to go do shit and he gets roped into kind of finding a bit of his his humanity. And each of these movies are a little bit of an arc of, you know, Max starts out in the be beginning being very um, fucked up by the wasteland. And I think outside of the first one where it's really showing like how he became Mad Max, these are all like, okay, now he's so distant from humanity and so removed. And how can this new group of people somehow show him like why it's worth still helping people and being a good human being in the wasteland? Um, and that's cool. Yeah, I think that uh, I I made the connection last week that obviously you know there are a ton of things that take influence from specifically this jumping off point with Max, um, and like things like Fallout where they have kind of like these like really grand, larger than life characters. I mean, obviously there's a character in this called Lord Humongous. I mean, that's about as larger than life as it gets. No, um, I think I do, do. <laughs> but. Um, there's one that I did a connection that I didn't make until after we completed that conversation, which I was like, Oh cool. We get to do this conversation again. Um, yeah, real cool. the Mandalorian. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, totally the cool. entire concept of him kind of stumbling upon this thing that he now has to take care of. Um, and 
you know, deciding whether or not he wants to get into the larger conflict of the story or if he still wants to be this wandering, you know, bounty hunter. Uh, I think the combination of sci-fi and Western is very apt in this and in that. So I see a lot, some connections there, obviously some inspiration there. But I think that's more that they take similar inspiration from the same place, which is, like you said last week, Clint Eastwood westerns, specifically like the the good, the bad, and the ugly and things of that nature. Well, even like the taking care of a, of a child sort of thing is kind of, you know, True Grit-esque. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> but yeah, all this stuff. It, I think it'd be really fascinating to do an episode at some point, maybe centered around something like Bone Tomahawk, where we talk about kind of how much westerns have just continued you know almost 100 years after the fact to influence everything that people like people are so even people who weren't alive when westerns were a big thing were like me probably and saw their grandparents or their parents watching westerns constantly on tv and were just heavily inspired by it and i mean clint's still kicking around um i could actually see pedro pascal uh playing mad max if this if fury road had come out like several years later i could easily see him being like the favorite for playing that character um so yeah that would be interesting but for anybody who doesn't really know uh, like we said what this movie is about max ends up um finding this this pretty cool like outpost that's built up of all of these um trucks and trailers and stuff and i guess that is how in western times caravans of people would build their little camp outposts as they would take all their wagons and make like a big circle out of them and then build their little outpost in the middle and that's really how towns became a thing like that's how our town pretty much became a thing was there was a railroad here um and people just started setting up these little outposts around and then that eventually grows into a town and then a city and that's how you get places like modesto but um Mm -hmm. yeah so max is is uh aided by his trusty dog named dog and I wanted to reshare the story of uh, what happened with this dog because it's very heartwarming. But um, when Miller and crew were searching for a pup to be in the movie, they stumbled upon this dog that was like a day away from being put down at a, sh- at a shelter. Um, and this dog just picked up a rock and started playing with the crew with just a rock. And they went, OK, well, if he gets that excited to play with a rock, he's going to be really easy to train. Um, So they ended up bringing him into the movie because the engines and all the explosions and stuff were so loud. They fit him with uh, custom made dog (laughs) earplugs, which is just adorable. So cute. And then after filming was complete, he ended up being adopted by one of the camera operators Mm -hmm. and never acted in a movie again. But I think his performance is great in Mm -hmm. this. Um, And also nice to know that he went on to live a a wonderful life after that. And also, I guess... He <laughs> <laughs> not again, not again. <laughs> and uh, he apparently got along so well with. Oh, I lived uh, a wonderful life, eh? <laughs> <laughs> bark, bark, bark. <laughs> wolf. <laughs> the wolf. The wolf got me. Wolf. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, man, I want to see that movie now. <laughs> um. He, uh, he got along so well with the actor playing the gyrocopter captain that they had to do some like fancy editing and sound design to make him just them just playing together look like the dog was angry at him uh. and like actually attacking him and biting him because they would just play and they like Aww. were super, super chill together. Um, so there's that. And then we talked about Humongous, who is one of the most memorable parts of this movie, probably because most people have seen the parody on South Park. Mm. Yes. Or in a hundred other places, but South Park, I think, did it the best. They did such a good job. That was probably one of my first exposures to the Mad Max universe and I didn't know what it was referencing at the time. Yeah. And later on I found out. And I think even Stan has a Road Warrior poster in his room. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 I, which at I least, never understood either. <laughs> I don't remember if it's if it's that way in the show for that long period of time, but I know for sure it was in the video game. What? Uh in Stick they of Truth. Has a poster? He has that poster in No, it's room. in the yeah. show for uh he has like the entire runtime. Yeah. I don't know about still. He don't know. Who knows? Well, Humongous was, and he's the leader of the uh, the gang of marauders that comes in and, and demands the gasoline. You know, walk away. Let us take your gasoline. We'll let you guys go. Obviously, Humongous and crew don't have any uh, any clothes. <laughs> any clothes. <laughs> But he is so eloquent. He almost doesn't even seem like a bad guy. Yeah, and that's what I like so much about uh, a lot of the characters in these Mad Max movies that makes them kind of stand out from your generic post-apocalyptic desert wasteland movie is that not everyone is just the same, just 
yeah, it's the post-apocalypse, you know, like, blah, blah, blah. You know, the, ev- you have the gyro captain who is, like, this real kind of pervy, like, uh, sex-driven uh, guy who throws snakes out of his fucking <laughs> gyrocopter. And then you have the feral kid who has, like, his whole mysterious backstory of how he got to where he is. And he's just, like, popping out of holes and throwing boomerangs and chopping fingers and heads off. And then you have Humongous, who, yeah, is this very eloquent, Shakespearean uh, metal hockey mask wearing buff nude wrestler dude uh he was originally supposed to be goose uh having survived his attack from the marauders in the first one having come back all burnt up and anakin skywalkered and they ended up dropping that i guess because they figured it might be too complicated and that seems to be the mo of this movie is like let's keep it as simple as fucking possible yeah and if they were trying to kind of rebrand and like i think you mentioned it in our lost recording um that people see have seen this didn't know there was a first one so if their plan was to release this under mm-hmm. the title the road warrior and not have any connection to anything one people wouldn't know what the fuck they were talking about and two it wouldn't be as impactful or mean anything to anyone so yeah. it makes sense for them to kind of drop it if yeah. they're trying to kind of restart the franchise yeah that's a really good point and um yeah so in the united states most people had not seen the original mad max when this came out um, so in the United States, this was just called the road warrior everywhere else. It was called Mad Max to the road warrior. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of people, you know, probably wandering into video stores and seeing the much more doper sounding road warrior <laughs> was like, I'm going to watch this. And people became obsessed and, you know, their whole childhoods were shaped around road warrior. And then they find out way later, Oh, this is a sequel. But I think that's really cool that just like with something like the evil dead, the sequel works on its own without having to see the previous one. I mean, the little recap in the beginning, beginning helps, but I think even without that, you wouldn't need to know anything about Max going into this to understand because it is a very basic Western. It's, you know, good guy or, or gray area stranger comes in and has to decide between the good guys and the bad guys and who he's going to help. And in this, he begrudgingly yeah decides to hash this plot with, the outpost people that they're he's going to drive their tanker of gasoline um out in a big chase where the marauders are going to come after them and he finds out spoiler alert again if you haven't seen this movie go check it out but he ends up finding out that the whole thing was a diversion so that the rest of the outpost could take all the gasoline and escape out in a different direction and they filled this tanker with sand and to me the reaction from max when he sees all the sand coming out kind of implies that he didn't know that this was the plan that he's kind of like surprised I do get that it. vibe off of him yeah and I like that because it shows that the outpost people don't necessarily <clears throat> trust him enough to give him the full plan they're just like you're just a tool to get us you know what where we need to go and what we need to do and so I like that kind of realization that he's not completely involved and but it still works out for him and well doesn't really because most of them get murked <laughs> right yeah and we talked about it before but that was kind of my biggest fault with this movie is just that like the the chase and everything that happens super dope mm-hmm. like in and of itself but as part of the movie it's like you have these two hostages that they've had the whole time that we're trying to save they just get killed nobody cares and then the like leader of the good guys he dies and then like the female leader she dies and yeah. it's like how much are you gonna do to create this illusion it's like that's still pretty fucked up that they would do that and doesn't like make a ton of sense and i was like ah you lost me a little bit there but i mean if you're it works out if your only real fighters your only real road warriors are your leaders i mean do you send fodder who won't get the job done and they end up finding out quicker that it's all a diversion and then they've got humongous crew on his on on their tail again (laughs) i mean it depending on how much you know grace you give it it yeah. it, it kind of does work itself out a little bit it didn't bother me as much just because i never really had i didn't really have an attachment to these characters and neither That's does max fair. really <laughs> um outside of the couple characters that do survive like the gyro pilot and like the feral kid who obviously we find out at the end of this is grown up and narrating the whole story about you know and then the road warrior disappeared and i never saw him again um which like my previous theory lends a lot of credence to that you know that these are all kind of stories i know that uh fury road kind of kicks that in the dick a little bit because it's narrated by max which 
but but that by the Fury Road, he's just like full blown schizophrenic, hallucinating. So yeah, maybe he's just imagining known. the entirety of Fury Road. But um, yes, yeah, so those the characters we don't have as much of an emotional attachment to, they don't even get like a cool badass send off. They just get like Ugh, shot with an arrow, and then their bodies are just like lying on the truck for the next five minutes of the chase. <laughs> and it's like it all feels very realistic, and that's something that I think carries over from the first one. And I actually think the first one um, did a bit better and i think it's intentional obviously because this is supposed to be a lot more of a fairy tale type like removed uh different world than the first one was i liked that the first one felt very realistic and uh, down to the car crashes and everything and in this the way people die and all of the crashes and everything as opposed to something like fury road where it's all done to like the immaculate every frame of painting you know guitar guy on a truck explosion thing this is just like shit crashing into in and exploding and it all feels very realistic and i think it loses a bit of the visceral nature of the first one Mm -hmm. in exchange for just being a better structured fairy tale type western movie so i'm having more entertaining characters yeah i do think that this movie overall is is a better movie um than the original but um i think that like that's why the original still has some merit for me to like you should go back and watch the first mad max because i think that's really where you can tell that these guys were putting their lives on the line they really were (laughs) yeah to make these stunts happen and in this you do get the stunt of the the guy flying off the road and clipping his legs on the like buggy as he goes by and that was an unplanned stunt and he like fucking shattered his legs to pieces and almost died um so there are still insane stunts happening in this movie and they are still very impressive um i think we talked about it last time too where some of that removal also comes from now all of these vehicles are like these custom tricked out like uh, buggies war, war and war machines and stuff yeah. as opposed to just a bunch of motorcycles and cop cars crashing into each other um yeah i think it all adds like like you were saying that like fanciful you know fantasy land type shit and i think that some of that is also by design just in trying to make a world that feels so removed over that short period of time of three years that's so far removed from the world that we witnessed previously in the other movie and i don't know if that's intentional due to the fact that they wanted to separate themselves from that movie or if it's intentional because they wanted to make it seem so much crazier than the the first movie either way i think what they end up with as far as like the car chases and the actual action the meat and potatoes of what you're looking for in a mad max movie is is done so well especially for the time yeah, and I think Max looks badass. Mel Gibson um, was obviously very committed to this role. Uh, he is the one who, once he got his costume, he did all of the wear and tear to it and like tore it up on set and took the sleeve off and did a bunch of stuff and you know, shaved into his eyebrows and fucked up his hair and did all that stuff. And they were and the way that Miller kind of directed everyone in the first movie and in this movie, and I assume probably in the next one, was he was like, come up with your own character's mm-hmm. backstory come up with your own costume. Everything has to be stuff that you can find in actual junk stores and places and, you know, and junkyards and things you could collect uh, to make these outfits. But pretty much everybody down to the feral kid got to invent their character's backstory and how they got to where they are and why Big they are the way D&D they are. Sesh. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like the, the kind of role I would want. And yeah, so he got to do that. And then uh, I mentioned previously that it was fucking freezing during the filming of this movie. You wouldn't know because of the way everything's lit and it's in the desert. You expect it to be very hot. But um, they shot during basically like the Australian winter and it was so cold that um, they they knew when they needed to get everybody into a bus and warm up when Vernon Wells uh, ass and his his assless chaps would go blue. (laughs) They would go, oh, oh, barometer bums going off again. Got to get everybody into a, a into a bus to warm up. And Gibson, according to Miller, was so professional that he would be teeth chattering, like shaking, uh, between takes and then as soon as miller said action he would just you know stop shivering get completely serious do the lines do the thing and then as soon as he called a cut he would start fucking shaking and and freezing again and that's just dedication to this project and i think it shows in uh again fury road i think overall takes everything that this movie does and does it better and does it bigger and flashier and better looking? But you would hope that after 30 years of, of technical achievements and those sorts of things. Well, yeah. And it's something that, that kind of reminds me of, too, is something like um, Terminator, where the first Terminator is great and has its own merits. But then it, to me, feels like T2 is where the technology caught up to where Cameron 
really wanted it to be to like because we talked when we were talking about terminator that a lot of what happens in t2 was supposed to be in the first terminator but they couldn't get the technology to where it needed to be um or something like avatar where obviously it took him years and years to get to that point to me fury road is probably what miller had in his head at least since road warrior um and finally got to the point where he was able to make it happen the way that he saw it in his head and i think that's such a cool like a lot of people complain about visual effects and computers and all that stuff but i think really what it's done is it's given a lot of filmmakers the ability to take exactly what's in their imagination and put it on screen instead of having to compromise every little detail um like in the right this, hands that works well if if it's a tool like an added tool to your tool belt totally works and i think that's what millie does with fury run we can talk more about that in a couple of weeks but he does his practical thing he knows what he's doing as far as that goes but then he uses the computers to then enhance that you know what i mean enhance but, yeah but i think in the case of if that's your entire tool then that's when the computer stuff sucks yeah and i i yeah, that's totally exactly what it is down to like, I think a really great example and something that I mentioned previously of like what I think still really works well about this movie as opposed to Fury Road is that in Fury Road, everything is color corrected to be exactly like I said, every frame of painting, like all of the sand is, you know, super orange. It's all this orange filtering and then all the nights are super blue and all the skies are obviously like they can be the exact skies that he wants to have in that shot in the Road Warrior. He had to just go with whatever skies in the desert he could capture and so it's a lot of filming it during sunrise and sunset which is like an hour window at most to film this stuff it's also typically the coldest time of day yeah and he said that he's had other directors come up to him and say like oh i could tell road warrior was really low budget because i was able to tell between scenes what was a sunrise and what was a sunset and like you know the different times of day and he was like hey i mean most people wouldn't notice and it was what we had to do to get those gorgeous skies and i think this movie is still fucking gorgeous for legitimately just being shot in the desert and it's like the beginning of outwaters where i was like oh this is just really pretty because it's really pretty shots of the desert um but there's also a movie here too yeah if you actually do something with the desert and make it interesting (laughs) then it can be it can be great but um yeah i mean i think if you have seen fury road and you haven't gone back and seen these movies i think especially i mean i can't really speak to thunderdome yet because i haven't rewatched it since i think we talked last time the last time i watched all these movies i think was right before fury road came out Mm -hmm. to prep and i had never seen them before and i remember thinking thunderdome was and most people agree the least good of the three i wouldn't say that i remember it being bad but the least good um but i think that road warrior especially definitely has a place in the classics canon still even with fury road it's just an embarrassment of riches you get george miller continuing to make mad max movies and continuing to make them to the point where a lot of people who grew up with road warrior are now saying fury road is the best one Mm -hmm. and that's pretty incredible for somebody who's been working as long as he has and took detours into things like babe and happy feet (laughs) um that he still can come back to this and make like a fucking uh you know fuel in your blood crazy flames guitars movie oh, and witness me yeah and uh, i'm 100 percent on board for the furiosa movie we talked we mentioned anya taylor joy that's something that she's gonna yeah. be in coming up uh with all chrissy hemsworth and uh then supposedly a fifth mad max movie called the wasteland, the wasteland. with tom hardy so we'll see but I, I i guess i want to just talk about the villains a little bit and see what you guys think and i know i mentioned it in our last recording, but the, really we get two. We get Humongous, and then I don't even remember the other guy's name. Humongous is friend with the Mohawk. Is he a Mohawk? I think it was like a Mohawk. Or um, like most of them do, and I guess the actors were really embarrassed about the Mohawks, so they would wear beanies when they went into town. <laughs> and then about halfway through the shoot, they all like got used to it and felt so badass with them that they took all the beanies off and would just go into town all Mohawked out. And <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so we get we get kind of these two villains, and one of them is really wiry and aggressive and then humongous is very just like whatever mm-hmm. um and i just didn't feel like we got enough time with either of them to really care about any of them as villains well and that's something like throw out that's something that fury road again just does better is that immortan joe feels like a better realized villain that we get to spend a lot of good quality time with yeah. to really he feels more in charge on. of his of his group where uh, you feel like Humongous is not in charge. He's just kind of like, like, oh, don't do that. And then they do it anyway. Well, and I think like it, it kind of makes sense where you have this like more evil, sadistic, smaller guy who 
maybe would be the leader of this clan if he was nine feet tall and, <laughs> and humongous. Um, but because not only is humongous a giant brick shit house, but also he's the better spoken mm-hmm. of the group, he was able to become the leader of this, but that this guy could make for like a more fuck like if he had been running the thing they probably would just charge right into the outpost and just started killing everyone yeah. and humongous is like no let's try to kind of cut a deal with them and try to pretend like we're still civilized even though we all look like you know fucking sex demons um <laughs> out here and i think they're even named like there's like the gay boys the smegma something or other like they all have like weird fucked up oh really yeah like all the name the names of the people in the clan but yeah, I think that that and the stakes in terms of in Fury Road, it being instead of gasoline, it's the brides of Immortan Joe. Right. And the future of his lineage and all that. And then the whole like, you know, Furiosa deciding which way she wants to go. Like all of that feels like there are much higher stakes than in this where it's like, I does he get the gasoline? Does he not get the gasoline? Um, and yeah, so... And sadly, his car gets destroyed. I was like, oh, shit. That's something where I'm like, he has probably the most badass car in movie history. And in every one of these movies, it just gets fucking wrecked. In this one, it gets fucked up. And then in, yeah, and in Fury Road, uh, in the first like five minutes of that movie, it it just gets driven through and explodes and Mm. this whole thing. And so it seems like Miller almost wants to poke fun at the audience like oh you really like the uh interceptor or whatever like or the pers- whatever it's called i don't think you gotta write this the yeah the interceptor i'm gonna blow it up in the first five minutes <laughs> of each of these movies but it's cool because it takes his trusty steed away and then he has to kind of like figure out how he's gonna get by and get his shit back together and um i kind of have been curious about going and checking out the mad max game that came out around fury road yeah i've heard it's more more akin to like you spend a lot of time on the road and like you're customizing the interceptor throughout the process. Yeah. That's the thing that I'm, I'm interested in is that most of the customization is not necessarily to your character. Like, yeah, you can change some of Max's clothing and stuff, but it's really about beefing up your car and making your car like the most deadly on the road. And, um, it's only like 20 bucks on play the PlayStation store. So I'm like, maybe I'll check it out between now and when we discuss Fury road and let you guys know what I think. But Yes, yeah, so if you want to know more uh, about kind of the backstory about Max, you can check out the comic books like you mentioned previously, Anthony. There's a lot more to this, and I think that Miller has a ton of notes, so commentaries might be a good place. And then I got some information from Mad Max Bible over on YouTube, so that was a good resource for me. But there's a ton of lore outside of the movies that doesn't even play into the movies. Like, Miller has probably similar to Flanagan, like, books worth of of notes and what he wanted it to be in the whole process behind getting at least Fury Road made was is pretty incredible. So I, I would suggest looking more into that if, if any of that background stuff interests you. Yeah, definitely. I listened to the George Miller commentary for this. He's a super chill, uh, really calm, pretty funny dude. Um, Doctor, which I think we corrected yeah. Dr. George Miller. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, so uh, again, just um, I think that this movie really still holds up. Mm -hmm. It still stands the test of time and just makes me even more excited to truck along into Thunderdome and Fury Road. I'm hoping that Thunderdome, like, kind of wins me over in its just sheer weirdness because i yeah, feel like that's what i remember from that movie effect. is that it <laughs> is that it pushes kind of like the weird characters to yeah. another level and then you get like just all kinds of weirdo characters in fury road so well i think if we go into it knowing that it's been 15 years of nuclear fallout and that might help make it have a little more redeeming qualities maybe make it have make it make a little bit more sense but yeah, make it make sense. If you're a fan of these movies and you have your own personal ranking of uh, Mad Max to Fury Road, definitely share that with us. I'm sure we'll do our own personal ranking at the end mm-hmm. after we talk about Fury Road in a couple weeks. But uh, right now, for me, it's two one. I think that's same. For yeah, you guys. yeah, <laughs> I'm totally in the same boat. But I, I think I liked one more than I remembered liking it. So it's a bit closer to Road Warrior. So I'll be really interested to see where the others fall. But yeah, that's all I got for. The Road Warrior. Yeah, I highly recommend it as well. Do your due diligence and see where the roots of everything comes from. And now, as we all know, you scream, you scream, I scream, we scream. The only one not screaming, Nev Campbell. Yeah, so stay (laughs) tuned for our final cut. The return of final cut. We're going to be talking about Scream 6. (laughs) Sixin. What do you know? I asked for final cut. 
and I got it. For the return of Final Cut, we are diving into Scream <laughs> Six. <laughs> so this one again is directed by Matt Benelli Olfen and Tyler Gillett. Gillett? Gillett. Sure. Um, <laughs> their their combined name is Radio Silence. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so okay. they are actually going to be working on the requel to Escape from New York. Okay. Coming right up. On. So, so also responsible for Ready or Not, the pre- last year's Escape. Scream 5. Yeah, I was kind of bummed that this one didn't have, like, I, I couldn't really come up with a cool, like, funny Scream 6 play on that title because we had five cream mm-hmm. for the last one. And it was uh scram v <laughs> scram v yeah <laughs> all right so again starring melissa barrera as sam carpenter and jenna ortega as tara we also get jasmine savoy brown returning as mindy and playing her brother mason gooding who i didn't realize is cuba gooding jr's son oh shit really yeah and um i don't want to get into too much spoiler territory we also got roger jackson returning as the voice and uh New characters, Dermot, old Dermot Maroney, Jack Champion, Josh Segarra, and uh, Lena Liberato. Yeah, I was like... A bunch of random. And then, I mean, I'm sure some people already know this, but Hayden Pantier is returning. Yeah, and I was like, where the fuck do I recognize the nerdy Jack Champion guy from? It's a uh, spider from yeah. Avatar. Yeah. I Which was I like, didn't oh, realize either. Without, yeah. without the loincloth and the mask, I with was the like... With the clothes on? <laughs> yeah, with clothes on, I didn't recognize you. Right, so we see the group moved to New York, and some of them are going to college. Some of them are just living their lives, and then oh, what happens? They ghost start face getting shows attacked up. by Ghostface again, yeah, and I- that's kind of the premise of the movie. <laughs> yeah, I was really hoping that we would go into this one, and it would just be this crew just enjoying their lives in New York, you know, just going over to the bodega, getting a sandwich, you know, going to go <laughs> to see a Broadway play, and uh, surprisingly, yeah, Ghostface came yeah. out and, and just like really wreaked havoc on this one. Yeah, so I mean, uh, we could talk about it as much as possible without spoilers. Uh, overall, I think it was an entertaining movie. Mm-hmm. I think that if you liked last year's and Scream 2, then you'll probably be a fan of this one as well. I wouldn't say it's pushing the envelope in too many ways, but I think it's an effective scream movie. Yeah, so um, I I had a really good time with it, um, and I am, and I think we, I mean, we all, re- I mean, you can just see the shirts. We're all really massive scream fans, so I think that's important to set because there are a lot of people who just like hate the scream franchise or really don't care about it, and they're probably going to be very negative on this movie. Um, and then there are people who are like diehard fans who are just like anything that has Ghostface is immediately a five star. And I feel a little bit left out in that. Again, I thought this was fine. Mm-hmm. Like, it was a good time. It was all right. But I didn't feel like it, it did anything to surprise me or really, like you said, push the envelope. Um, but I still feel like it it belongs in the Scream franchise. Like It doesn't feel like a really strange outlier, which is what I was a little bit nervous about with them changing the location and going to New York. I know they've changed location, like going to Hollywood in previous movies. I mean, only and two stuff, of, but... of the five, well, I guess three of the five now, or three of the six. So half of them have been in Woodsboro, but half of them haven't been. Yeah, but I think that New York is obviously like they were really playing up the New York new rules, and New York is obviously where franchises go when they don't have any other ideas. <laughs> um, Look at you, Jason. Yeah, I'm really hoping that for the next one they go to space, but, you know, we'll <laughs> see. Uh, what about you, John? What were your feelings on this coming out of it? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I had fun. I feel like it does fit with the with the remainder of the canon, and it still is really consistent, which is what you're looking for for a franchise, especially this many films in, is that the consistency stays. I still feel like after watching this, Scream is still probably top two or three most consistent franchises of all time. Um, I think that it does sorely lack the presence of Nev, uh, her being in the film would have been the little cherry on top that would have made this, you know, really good. Um, and I think that the brutality is 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 a is a fun, you know, fun expansion. Like they feel like they have to kind of step up their game. Ghostface like, finally learned that combo, that Mortal Kombat combo. Yeah, brutality. <laughs> yeah, the fatalities are are a little a little crazier. Um, I feel like this new cast is doing a lot more. 
I feel like we had some complaints about some of them in the in in their first foray with Scream Five, mm-hmm. and I feel like in Scream Six, a lot of them have gotten gotten into bigger places. And obviously, Jenna Ortega is still you know phenomenal. Uh, I feel like she has probably the most the you know like the most clear career after this. Yeah. Uh, once all these films are done, um, but yeah, I said I had a good time. I felt like the kills were fun. Um, it is predictable. But I'm not really complaining about that necessarily. Um, yeah, but I feel like they set it up to be predictable in a yeah. lot of ways. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not like I said, I'm not mad yeah. about it being predictable. Yes, and I think some people will probably be upset about that. But yeah, that's that's been my feeling for the last couple. Has been you know if their intention is to not make the reveal be the big crazy like big deal reveal because it's just not going to have as much impact uh, as previous ones, and instead to kind of telegraph it. And say like, hey, if you picked up on it along the way, good job. If you didn't, you'll still be surprised. You know, it could go either way. But um, yeah, if you are someone who really, really digs brutal kills and uh, in your horror movies, if you're somebody who like fucking loves the Terrifier movies, or you felt like Halloween Kills was a step up because the kills were more brutal, then I think you will fucking love this movie. And I think that's the reaction that a lot of people are having. I've seen a ton of people ranking this as like their second or third if not in some cases, their number one favorite in the franchise. Um, I, again, feel like I'm kind of missing out on something because, like, I'm looking at my letterbox and I have definitely the lowest rating out of anybody that I've seen, not in, like, all of the reviews, but at least in my circle of people that I follow. Most people are putting this up in, like, four-star, five-star category. Um, I'll just say, for me, this is about a three, but so is Scream 3 and I think Scream four maybe like a couple of these also lie in the three category and um i still really enjoy the shit out of them so uh if you're looking for just uh, an even bloodier and even more brutal scream and you kind of wanted the franchise to start taking a different direction i think because the core four as they're referred to in this does step up a bit more to the plate i i have a bit better feeling about the future of this franchise because i thought their performances were were really good yeah yeah, so I, uh, I I would say recommend. You guys recommend as well? Absolutely, yeah. 100%, yes. Yeah. yeah, so there you go. That's our best um, discussion on that without getting into spoilers. So now we oh, are... Keep your eyes peeled for references. They're completely all over the place as per usual. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that... It would be like scene, if we made like, a Scream Jesus movie. This is, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like you can tell that, that the Radio Silence guys are very much like on the same level as us in terms of just, let's just throw in as many references on posters in the background and on TVs as we possibly can uh, and stay away from Night of the Living Dead. Right, (laughs) yes. So we are going to now discuss some spoilers. So again, Uh, go see it. Worth it. Worth the, you know, 11 to $20. I don't know how much. (laughs) Some places are very expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would say probably skip the 3D. There was nothing in this movie that I was like, why the fuck did they make this? Oh, did you see it in 3D? No. Okay. I'm just saying like there was, it's not, it's like an afterthought. It's like, why do that? It's like a money grab because I think Avatar was popular. <laughs> exactly. It's it's what I knew was going to happen when Avatar came out and made a shit ton of money, which is now movies are going to start being in 3D for at least a little bit yeah. after this um, just to try to make that extra box office money. And I'm sure it helps with, you know, post-pandemic uh, grosses and stuff. But yeah. this movie is doing gangbusters. Uh, so check spoiler it out. time, right? Yep. That? Yeah. Okay. Wow. You don't want to spoil spoiler, time. Yeah. spoiler time. So what did surprise me about this movie <clears throat> is the opening. So we get Samara weaving, playing a professor. And so, you know, we get the meta commentary happening almost immediately, which is super fun. Um, And we knew she was going to (laughs) die. Yeah. Uh, Which was great. It didn't have the same hit as as Drew, but it never does since then. Anyway, what then surprised me is then we get the reveal of who killed her. And I was like, oh, shit. Yeah. And for me, I was like, are they going to continue with that? Like, are we going to know it's him and maybe somebody else? throughout the whole time and see how he manipulates the group and i was like that's kind of cool flash from from the new spider-man movies right yeah yeah and, P- uh, P- yeah. Uh, uh, and penis, from grand budapest uh penis parker <laughs> yeah and a uh, servant but right, um, yeah so then then the cold opening continues and we almost get like a second opening yeah and see him get killed and i was like okay now i'm double surprised and i was like that's cool it's kind of a good way to start because we know that the Scream franchise does these cold openings. Mm-hmm. We know, and we know what to expect. And so, if it would have ended right there, I would have been like, "Okay, that's normal. That's par for the course." And so, to take it a step further, I was pretty excited about that. Yeah, they seem to. They still seem to find a way to 
um, do something interesting because they know they're never going to top the impact of the original opening with with Drew. So like in four, they had the the repeat, well, repeated sequel like <laughs> openings where they kept being like, oh, just kidding. That's a stab opening. Just kidding. That's a stab opening and having a bunch of famous actors in those scenes. And then for five, the big deal was Jenna Ortega was already kind of a big name at that point, And everybody was like, well, she's going to be in the movie. And then in the beginning, they kind of kind of rope a dope you into thinking that she's stabbed to death and then you know mm-hmm. post the cold opening you find out that she survived and that's the whole thing um and then in this one yeah you get double cold openings and i was kind of hoping that this was the direction that they were going to go in which is do it kind of like a poker face where we know who the killer was mm-hmm. and it's about everybody else trying to figure out how to get that person i was like ooh, i could see tony revelori like when he started walking back toward the college i was expecting him to kind of just like fold into the core four friend group and be a part of their friend group for like the rest of the movie yeah, and kind of have them try to figure out how he's manipulating them and all that stuff. Um, but I still liked that. We go back to his apartment and of course he's watching uh, Jason takes Manhattan. Woo! Um, so we Called get that it. reference out of the way real quick. <laughs> Why, and his name is Jason. Yeah. So we get that. And then he has posters all over his walls that are references to all kinds of different movies. He talks about uh, how he got like a, a C on his Giallo paper. So we got a little Giallo shout out. Uh, my... They mentioned later like the like that. Uh, oh, isn't he the weirdo who's really into Argento? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's the matter with liking cheese, man? And uh, <laughs> so we find out that there are kind of ghost face disciples, these people who have decided that they are going to kind of use the face of ghost face to feel what it's like to kill people. And so he has this like really fucked up little uh, monologue with who he thinks is his friend on the phone um, saying like, oh yeah, she, when I first started, like when I started stabbing her, like she stopped being a human, she was an animal and then she was just meat or whatever and all this stuff. Um, And we find out, yeah, that she was there, his film professor. And I was like, I joke to you guys, if Samara Weaving was my film studies professor and she was talking about slashers, I'd, I'd, be, as, I'd be as screaming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I also like that Samara Weaving gets to use her actual accent for once in the beginning of this. Cause I think she's also Australian, which is funny because Margot Robbie is also Australian and they're frequently confused for each other mm. in Babylon. They use that to great effect because uh, Samara Weaving plays an actress and then Margot Robbie comes onto the scene and is like the better version of her and like takes over her roles oh in God. movies. And so I was like, well, somebody obviously picked up on yeah. how they're always getting confused and worked them both into a plot. But yes, yeah, so we get that whole opening and then we come back to our core four and kind of see how they are going on with their lives. So um, Sam... Yes, do, do we get the little therapy session at this point? Is that Melissa Barrera? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And I thought in five, she was kind of dull. I didn't love her performance. Mm-hmm. She didn't really do shit for me. It was really more about Jenna Ortega. From what and I've seen from most people, they agreed. And then most people agree that in this, she really steps it up. Yep. That was exactly what I was going to say. I was like, yeah, you did. Uh, yeah. Again, stepped it up. She carried the movie in a lot of ways and she did a fantastic job, even to the point when we get to the ending stuff and she, has kind of a she's a different character where you know she i mean i guess it's all kind of like she's a protector but where she's like a victim and then when she becomes a kind of the i don't know like the attacker i guess uh she pulls that off too. yeah and uh-huh. i was like fuck like you got this character you have done a really good job with sam at this point and i thought that it was a much better performance this time around well and this is where i feel like it's actually really good for this new cast that we've gotten rid of Dewey and we don't have Sid in the movie because it gives, you know, Sam and these other characters more opportunity to be fully realized characters and have Sam kind of take on the Sydney role of being the survivor who just like Sydney was in like, uh, I think it's three when she's like hiding away from the world and everything. She's kind of going that direction where she's like, I'm going to have a bunch of locks on my door and kind of like not get into a really, you know, supposedly not get into a relationship with anybody and kind of keep my <laughs> life super private um, and deal with this all myself. And then you have her sister, Tara, who is going kind of in the opposite direction of which I liked too of going, why should I my entire life be affected by the three days of horrible that, stuff yeah. that happened to us and i'm like i totally get both perspectives like i don't know which i would fall on like if my brain would go okay if you're ever going to get past this you need to start going and living your life and doing things with people and then there's also on top of that the part of my brain who is the horror movie watcher who knows they're about to get attack- attacked by ghost face <laughs> and in my head i'm going tara you fucking idiot 
like this is going to affect you for the rest of your life no matter what because you're in a franchise yep yeah. <laughs> which they talk about yeah you and then jump in there uh yeah i mean i think that that as we kind of expand into what's actually taking place here in manhattan there's some really like life scary moments that are kind of built into this obviously the therapist being you know a kind of an asshole and and you know making a lot of assumptions based off of what he's told um even though there's no what seems like no imminent threat from sam he like takes this like stance of like oh i have to be very by the book and i have to do all these things and i have to report you and i can't be your therapist anymore and like even though he was the one who kind of coaxed her into having this conversation uh that shit i i could definitely feel like that that would suck like i'm as somebody who like was very particular about the therapist that i picked when i went to therapy like i was like i need i need like some fucking uh some like hardcore like uh tony soprano shit i need someone who's ready for the stupid shit that goes on in my head to talk to have conversations and i you know i've i found success in that but it makes you kind of like wonder like oh you know if you kind of let the wrong thing slip that somebody might misconstrue how you're feeling or what you're saying and that kind of sucks well and i like that she is obviously <clears throat> making that attempt to try to do the right thing to move mm-hmm. on with her life and and she keeps hitting roadblocks and that's like why she is struggling so much while Tara's way of trying to deal with it is like I'm going to go get drunk and like just you know fuck some guy at a party and that's you know maybe not the right way to handle it but she's having seemingly more success doing it that way than Sam is with going to the therapists who won't talk to her and all that well Tara also is yeah, I mean she's doing those things but in the broader picture she is just living the life of a newly college student and she says that she's like i'm gonna get my degree i'm gonna get a job i'm gonna move on with my life i'm gonna stop thinking about this i feel like some of that isn't a put on though obviously this is this is the i am going to outwardly show that these are the things that i'm doing but it's all meant to cover the fact that i'm struggling with these things well then we get like mindy has a line that kind of bothered me on the face of it but i can see it as also being a similar coping mechanism where she at one point her girlfriend asks her like aren't you worried that you're going to get attacked again, you know, like you did? And she goes, oh, you know, I think of it like lightning. Like, it's not going to strike the same place twice. And in my head, I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? It happened to Sydney like four and a half times. Um, But I could see that as being like, this is how they're trying to cope with the situation is like, if we move to a new city and we pretend like it isn't going to happen and we kind of distance ourselves from it, then maybe it won't happen. Like, it's, it's, it's wishful thinking. They're like, okay. And Sam seems to be the only one who is like, yeah, I got a pretty good feeling that we're not done with this. And a lot of that comes from the fact that and Tara brings this up at one point. Like, she is going through it much worse than they are because she has the obvious familial connection to uh, Billy. And she has been going through therapy to try to not see him in reflections and have hallucinations of him. And she seems to be getting to a spot where that's slowed down. And then she also, we find out the reason they moved from Woodsboro and to New York is because this big conspiracy theory started where people were saying, oh, well, she's related to Billy Loomis. She was actually the killer in Scream 5, and she orchestrated it so that her boyfriend and all of them would take the fall. I felt like that was obviously very accurate to the way that fake news and conspiracy theories spread on the internet these days. So all of that... Again, like these are ideas where they could make an entire screen movie just around the idea of what was in the opening, which is people following after Ghostface and um, making some sort of cult almost of people practicing to be the next Ghostface. Mm-hmm. That's one idea that doesn't fully get fleshed out, but makes a cool co- cold opening. And then there's this that has some good moments, but also doesn't fully get fleshed out is this idea of the whole conspiracy theory culture and all of that stuff. And so it gets touched on a little bit. Um, but not to the extent that I feel like it really reaches its potential of where it could have been. But I did think it was pretty fucked up how she's just like walking down the street after the party and that chick comes up to her and like throws her drink at her or whatever. And she got victimized and then the media played it like she was the one that was assaulting. (laughs) Yeah. It made her look bad. And I was like, well, I think this movie is saying a lot of things. Like, yeah, like you're saying, it doesn't flush them all out. But it's definitely touching on some hot current topics. Yeah. Which I is, think, I think yeah. what a good screen movie does. Like, mm-hmm. that seems to be what they've done throughout the course of it. Four was, like, the start of the social kind media. of social media yeah. video era. And then five is 
pushing that even further and getting into the whole like people inspired by the stab movies and all this and then in this one we get into like the real uh, shitty side of the internet and how it can eat, ruin your life about as much as a ghost face killer coming in and stabbing the shit out of you. Well, yeah, I mean, and if you look at the way that culture is kind of headed as of right now, like you have all of these like conflicting reports about like these like internet micro celebrities and stuff, you know, like they're like, there's always like the person who's like, Oh, you know, I, I'm a total stand for this person there. You know, they're the, the person whose content I watch the most. And then there's always the vocal minority that's talking about how, oh, well they did this in their past and they did this. And it's like, so many things are based off of doctored footage or, you know, like there's like, you know, you know, deep fakes or, you know, things that are kind of cut and taken out of context and that not everybody is always the way that they seem based on the way they're being portrayed by the media or on social media. Yeah. Um, one thing that I wanted to talk about is the parallels with Scream 2. So as much as 5 was a remake of 1, this in a lot of ways felt like a remake of 2. Uh, we get the opening that is centered around the stab movies. Mm-hmm. Same thing with two, right? Yeah. Um, so that was cool. And then we get these film geeks, like with Mickey. Um, big spoiler: we get the familial ties to who they killed in the first one. Yeah, apparent. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, and then also, like they both end in the theater. <laughs> Just a different type of theater. Yeah, yeah, that's a good um, point. I didn't even put that together. The whole college yeah. setting. Yeah, college setting exactly away from Woodsboro. Also, the fact that there's a boyfriend character that we are suspicious of, but then has nothing to do with anything. Uh, yeah, and I was like, man, this they they really did take parts of that movie. Like, I'm sure they had to have. Well, and I'm intentionally. Yeah, I'm curious to know if that's their plan going forward because that's kind of boring <clears throat> to me. Like I, like yeah. If, I don't. If they keep remaking them, then what happens when they get to five? <laughs> yeah, and I thought that them. So they have the obligatory um, Mindy's character, who is kind of the you know the Randy, and obviously the niece yeah. of Randy, and um, even brings up like how he was killed when they're in the van. And, like she was like, "This is how our uncle died." Oh, like, that's another yeah, parallel. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, they're in a van. Yeah. yeah, they do the whole like trying to walking around the park, trying to get Ghostface to come out in the open. Yeah, so there's um, a bunch where it's like this is kind of the same movie so they lay out basically telegraph the plot of the movie in that conversation just like they did in the previous one where they pretty much telegraph who the bad guy is going to be in this they immediately suspect uh spider and um so you have that and then she also says oh yeah she's like oh you know this is a uh a, a sequel to a requel which puts us in a franchise which means that this should be a remake of like stab two and they kind of mention it and I was hoping they mentioned it as a way for them to them then subvert that. And instead, mm-hmm. they're just like, we're going to mention it so that you understand why we're just going to copy Scream 2. And while I don't think it's a, a carbon copy, I I don't know how much I want them to continue to just remake, you know, then remake 3 and then remake 4. Yeah. Yeah. I doubt that's what they'll do. Yeah. But I'm just like, okay, don't go down the, uh, you know, Star Wars route of like, I'm just going to remake a new hope and then kind of have my empire strikes back. And yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I think that there's a, a lot to be said as well about the convert. Obviously every screen movie has that, like that long drawn out conversation with their version of Randy about, you know, uh, what's, what is about to take place and kind of spelling out all these things. And I think that in previous movies, this is part of where, where maybe I have some issues is that in previous movies, when they tell you that something's going to happen, it typically happens. And in this movie, it doesn't happen. They're like, oh, so basically they're like, someone from Core 4 is dying for sure, and nobody from Core 4 dies at all. They all survived in the another, end of the movie. Another problem that I had with the with the movie. I'm like, I'm like they, they don't kill any of them. They don't kill Gale. They don't kill Kirby. Like... So all of the characters that you're supposed to give a shit about all survive. So it's like they say that the new people aren't supposed to just be cannon fodder and they end up being fucking cannon fodder. It's safe in ways that five wasn't because killing yeah, we Dewey were is pretty, such a huge thing. We were pretty sure one of the OGs was going to die and they did. And it's so fucking like impactful in that movie. You're like, holy shit. And if one of them can die. Anybody can die. And so we're led to believe that, which is a similar approach that Wes took when he was making the originals. And in this one, we are led to believe that they could die, but then we don't get 
any payout from that. And it's really well, frustrating. And to me, it almost, the way it's handled with a couple of them very much feels like they hadn't decided until like the very last minute if they were going to kill those characters or not because you have Mindy's character who, who basically dies on the subway. <laughs> yeah, she gets repeatedly stabbed uh, you know, th- in different occasions in the movie and then disappears like, you know, they get her to a hospital or whatever and then she's just running up like everything's cool at the end like, yeah, Mindy's coming down here and she's running up like, oh, hey guys, what's up? I'm on a lot of drugs and then with Gail, you get a really, I thought, awesome showdown between her and Ghostface in the apartment. It was probably one of my favorite scenes of the the whole movie. The hang up and then redial and then fucking shooting where the phone came from. So good. Yeah, you can tell she's like, and the the way that when her boyfriend or whoever is like, oh, it's for you. It's He says it's the killer and she just gets up like, all right. Which was hella funny. (laughs) Yeah, and she's like, you know, basically like, what do you want? And um, it's just kind of taunting him. I thought that all of Gail's moments as few and far between as they were in this felt straight up just gail weathers she's yeah. snarky and showing that she's kind of the boss of this franchise because she's the only one who's still there who's Even still involved gets punched again which is part of scream too. <laughs> like, nice little subversion yeah. there of her dodging it and then getting you know socked from the other side by uh tara but i thought her showdown was really great and so when sh- i thought you know sad as it made me when i thought she was going to die i was like this makes sense she had a great showdown she has that line of like tell sydney he didn't get me I think that situation, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Because if they kill Gale, then we get a repeat. Yeah. Then we get Dewey again. And if they don't kill Gale, then it does feel kind of empty and hollow. And but so then, it's like, what are we going to do to subvert the expectations? Because again, during that speech, she tells us we're going to subvert all your expectations. So I think we all thought Gale was going to die. But then having it just be a line of dialogue at the end that's just like, oh, and Gale's all right too. Yeah. And not having her show up again and not having any sort of like real resolution to that makes me feel like they hadn't decided for sure if they wanted to repeat their th- steps. And to me, if this movie is supposed to be us pushing further into this new generation of Scream characters, I don't want to be wondering if Gale's going to show up in the next one and the next one um, or if Sid's going to come back in the next one. I would prefer if they just said, and to me it makes total sense, she goes, hey, I called Sid. She's going to take uh, the husband and the kids. They're going to go off into hiding somewhere. It makes 100% sense to me. And really, it didn't bother me that much. Yeah, I, I missed having Sid in the movie, but I yeah. felt like the core four did well enough that I didn't miss her too much. Like, I was like, cool, she's gone. They're in New York. It makes sense that she wouldn't go all that way to be there. What? I, I, I kind of want to, if we're going to do this, let's do this. Like, let's get the next movie being just the new characters and, and I, get rid of everybody else. I think this is the point to do it because five... <clears throat> is her, her boyfriend point, yeah. her boyfriend is kind of obsessed with this idea with this with the stab franchise right mm-hmm. so it makes sense that he would want to kill Dewey and Gail and Sid now these people they're they don't care about that yeah they have a connection to uh Quaid's character I, I forget his name Richie really. Kirsch. Richie yeah. yeah but their real concern is now with this group so this these killers only want uh Sam like, they don't care about what Sid or anything. So now we have already lost the connection to the original three. Well, and So that's, now let's move forward. Like you're saying, like, we don't really need them anymore. Again, I want Sydney, yeah. but I think that what you're saying <coughs> makes sense to do at this point. Yeah, I think this is the time to do it. Um, and really, it's confusing that they didn't fully commit to it, mm-hmm. especially since, yeah, with the reveal, I think a lot of people are probably going to be very disappointed. I've seen a lot of people disappointed because people spent a fucking year going on and on about how it's going to be Stu. It's going to be Stu. It's going to be Stu with no indication that it was ever that Matthew Lillard was even remotely involved. It's going to be Stu getting all their hopes up. And yeah. And I think that's a comment because they saw what was on the internet for the last year and was like, let's make a comment about, you know, if you believe he's really dead. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And, you know, he could come back in future ones. That's whatever. But so I, I was of two minds when I first got out of it I thought okay that was a little bit disappointing because it felt like the way that it was building up with like the ghost face has collected all the costumes and, and uh, items from the previous killings and we're dropping the masks in reverse order and to me that meant we're leading back to the beginning and that it, I was like oh so it is going to be Stu because we're leading back to the first masks I liked that again it subverts your expectation and goes no now we're not concerned with the drama from that past group now the killers are fully focused on what you guys did in the previous movie and what your crew is responsible for and they're blaming you for it and I like that like you know all of the Scream movies the first four at least were based on Sydney's mo- what Sydney's mom did and what Sydney did in response to that with other killers and it was all connected to her. Cool. Now let's move on to the next generation and have all of the ghostface killers be connected 
personally to this group of people. Um, and I thought it was cool to have at least Richie like showing up on the phone and his home videos at the end. And I guess that's why the mask was supposed to be aged and old is because it's from his home movies or something. Like, no, well, it's Billy's, but it's just old. Yeah, well, then they had multiple old masks. I don't know. It was kind of confusing. I liked the look, though. I thought yeah. it looked pretty badass. I mean, I guess that's the connection. Like, the big buildup is to reveal that it was Richie's obsession. Like, really us seeing how much his obsession had overtaken. Uh, which I guess would have doesn't make a ton of sense because we don't really care about Richie anymore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the only reason I care about Richie is because it's it's Jack Quaid. Right. And I like Jack Quaid. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, but the actual reveal of who it was, I think, was telegraphed pretty quickly as soon as mm-hmm. Dermot Moroni showed up and was hamming it the fuck up with all of his lines. I was like, <laughs> okay, it's him. Then as soon as the... Um, I even had a thought. I was like, what if this time there's three? And I was like, well, there you go. <laughs> and then the, uh, the sister... Especially because they put so much emphasis on, like, when they're doing the police business. And it's like, two, two. There's always been two. And then, and three, they were like... Oh yeah, you're pretty ambitious there, fella. Yeah, whatever. and then the sister kill, uh, character, you know, they make sure she has a line where she says, "Oh, when my brother, when we lost my brother, mm-hmm. you know, through my fan." And I was like, "Okay, so her brother is probably Richie from Five. And then when she gets killed, they show Ghostface, which I thought was a really cool. Sus- that whole sequence was really cool and suspenseful of like the neighbor trying to get their attention from across the way and seeing Ghostface in the in the bedroom. And it would make sense how he got in because she probably let her brother in. And then they only hear her being attacked. You don't see her being attacked. And then she just gets pushed out of the room all bloody. And so that obviously is like them doing her all up with blood in the room. And I don't know how the neighbor... I'd have to rewatch to see where the neighbor was at that point because wouldn't he just look into a room and see them going like, okay, so we got to put some blood up here and we got to do some up here. But they probably pulled it off the way they did in the original screen where he walks up and pretends to stab him and then they put the blood on or whatever. Yeah. But anyway, we find out that she's involved and then kind of funnily enough, the character that Mindy the entire movie has been like, I got my fucking eye on you, the nerdy side guy who's just like, I don't even know why I'm in this fucking group. Mm-hmm. Uh, he doesn't know why. Because he's there because he's part of the he's he's Jack Quaid's brother. And um, yeah, so I mean, the reveal wasn't like, oh, my God, that's amazing. I didn't hate it. It just got kind of like overboard when it's all three of them, like doing their villain monologue at the end of like, and you thought you were so clever to do this. And now I'm going to fuck. And I'm like, the more you talk, the more chance you're going to get from for Deus Ex so and so to show up in the corner and shoot the shit out of you. Right. That's pretty much what happens. uh, Yeah. Another parallel to two. Where a character sh- pops up after you thought they were dead and starts shooting people. <laughs> like, yeah, they try to do a little bit of like a, we're going to trick you into thinking that it was Kirby. Yeah. Did you guys believe that at all? Like when it got revealed? Or no. did you think that was a red herring? I would have liked it though, to be honest. Like I, and we've talked about it. I love the idea of somebody who was in this survived losing it afterward. That trauma taking over them and then them becoming the killer. And they even touched on it and they're like, Sid wouldn't make sense. And I was like, ah, oh, just fucking do it already. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was, I was like, whatever, if it's Kirby, it's Kirby, but who else? Cause I knew it wasn't just Kirby. Yeah. Yeah. On, on a performance level, I mentioned it to you guys. I think that Hayden Pan- Panettiere maybe isn't necessarily super comfortable in front of the camera because she has taken some time off. And, um, so to me that plus some of her, the writing for her character, it felt very like wooden. Mm-hmm. It felt very strange. Um, but I really liked the having, you know, Gale from the first gen victims of, of Ghostface and then having Kirby from that, like, you know, Scream 4 re- sort of, you know, reboot generation and then having this new generation and having them say like, oh, you know, she was a senior when I was a freshman. And so they kind of knew each other that way. And it was still really cool to see Kirby come back and that she does have that really nice moment with, um, I don't know. I don't remember if it's Sam or Tara where they're sitting in the theater and she's like, how did you like, what did you do to get over it? And she's like, well, I decided I'm going to take down the monsters. Like I'm going to join the FBI and I'm going to take them down. I was like, Oh, that's cool. I like that. Like that seems like a obviously logical way to try to get over your trauma. And that's what a lot of this movie is, is like different people. Everyone is trying to take a a drastically different route for dealing with their trauma. They're either getting involved Mm -hmm. in law enforcement going to counseling or they're murdering more people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> John, can you talk a little bit about, I guess your thoughts on specifically the core four plus Gail and Kirby 
their invincibility. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah. I, so here's the deal. Like, I, armor. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty blatant in this. Um, I think Gale, like, she suffers enough wounds to die. I think Kirby suffers enough wounds to die. Um, uh, and then Mindy, the Mindy, Mindy and then what's Chad. the yeah uh chad specifically he's literally chad's, named chad. <laughs> yeah. chad chad's is the worst yeah. uh i mean they stab him they're both pretty bad the twins. I, they stab him all the way across uh, on both sides along his arms through his chest uh, in his neck area i mean they stab him like 30 40 times it's like you don't just walk away from that just walk away <laughs> you don't walk away <laughs> yeah um i i just don't i don't think that i think that at least one of them needed to die because well, yeah. all of the characters you care about are still here. Well, and we've had characters get stabbed in previous films and survive. Um, Dewey. <laughs> but Dewey, so Dewey was like the champ of it, and it was almost uh, felt to me like a running joke throughout the movies, right. and that's why it made it so devastating in the last one when he finally does that, get killed. The way he gets killed. Yeah, um, so that was insane, and and it kind of made sense. Like it was, And even in the first one, he was supposed to die, and then his character was so likable that they were like, okay, we'll have him have a surprise survival at the end. Um, but again, to me, it just feels like waffling where they're like, okay, we're going to kill these characters off. And then it's like, well, no, we kind of like Chad, which I agree. I mean, I was really sad because he was actually my favorite of the core four. I felt like he didn't like him as much in the first one, but liked him a lot more. In this yeah. One. Just with all of them. I felt like I liked uh, Jasmine Savoy in the previous one, mostly because I liked her in the leftovers and I, and in yellow jackets oh and I've seen her in other stuff. And I still think she's great in this. I love how she, just like over it. She is like, even when she's got stabs, she's just like, Oh my god! And then even then, she's like, "Oh man, I thought I had the right person, and I did have the right person." And she's obviously like very like into the film thing. But I thought that Chad was very charming. I loved the beginning when he's like trying to protect Tara before uh, Sam comes in and tases that dude in the balls. But when he's like Sean kind of, I'm gonna tase you in the balls. Now. But he's like a gentle giant, and I really liked his character, and so it made me really sad to see him stabbed but to me i was like cool i got some emotion out of that exactly. and i'm sad that he's dead but they make you really they walking dead you mm -hmm. and then it's right after they fucking kiss and i was like yeah cool and then i was like maybe that's the thing that really fucks tara up and then we get to see her have to deal with this trauma well and i think a lot of people are going to be like yeah this is the most brutal one but not really because nobody dies that we know like you said, it's just fodder. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, if some main characters had, and I understand you can't kill all of these people because you want to make a sequel. Like, that's the other thing that makes me think, of course, seven is going to happen because mm -hmm. that's why they would keep at least the core four alive. I would have loved for them to kill Sam or Tara, to be honest. I know it's not going to happen, but how much would you be like, oh, fuck. Yeah. I, I just give me something that makes me like jump out of my seat and go, oh, shit. Here's the idea. You kill Tara. Because it's subverting expectations as far as you possibly can, because your your main draw and your main star at this point is mm -hmm. Jen Ortega. Yeah. You kill Tara, and that's yeah. what that's causes that Sam snap. turn into the killer. But then, okay, I I'm on board with that. But then going into seven, do we care about Sam as much as we care about Sam and Tara and the core four? Like, do we care about Sam as much without Tara? Because that is kind of Tara's drive or Sam's driving force. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, we but care it, about them as a pair. But it could be cool to kind of get like the what we were talking about at the very beginning of the movie, getting kind of like the look behind the mask and watching Ghostface go through these processes. If it's yeah. Sam, that could be very entertaining. Well, it seems like that's what they've been building up to for the past two movies. The first one played a lot with her seeing Billy and kind of questioning whether it was in her blood. And then this one, she obviously. As much as I'm like, okay, that's not how serial killing works. Like, it's not just, oh, because you're related to this person, you're yeah. then, you know, destined to be evil. But it's, you know, it's horror movie logic, whatever. So um, I I was glad they pared down how much we saw Billy in this. It's only in that reflection of his case at the museum. I think to keep, to keep, keep looking young. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But um, I was But like, then they dropped the mask at the end. I was like, yeah, have her keep it. And let's go. I thought that was going to be where the cut to black was, was yeah. her looking at the mask and maybe cut back to her and then cut. And it goes, ooh, maybe in the next one, she's going to be the killer. And I'm totally on board with yeah. them doing that direction and going, <laughs> okay, we teased in the first one, what if we were or in this previous one in six, we teased what if we reveal the killer to you right at the beginning to maybe test the waters to see how people would feel about that idea. And then they obviously didn't commit to it in the next one if they do that have Sam be the one who's the killer and then have us all have to, the, the rest of the core four has to try to either save her from the brink before she murders everyone, or they just have to stop her. And it's really tragic because they have to try to get rid of her after two movies. Or and whatever. Tara's the one that has to kill her. 
Yeah. But I think that's a good word to use. They don't commit. And I feel like that could be said about this entire movie. I feel like five, they committed. In this one, they don't commit. Even- People get stabbed, they don't commit. I mean, Chad, didn't he basically die in the last one? Like, he got pretty badly hurt twice. Yeah. And I get it, it happens, but like, yeah, they don't commit to anything. They don't commit to the ghost mm-hmm. racing. They don't commit to killing any of the characters we know. To me, like, they don't even commit to the setting. Like, you mentioned that this seemed to lack some oomph. Mm-hmm. And I was like, so, shockingly, the movies before this that took place on a much smaller scale in terms of setting, whether it's Woodboro, Woodsboro or a college, and I guess the biggest they've been before is like Hollywood. Yeah. But with this, to me, it felt like, okay, you're in New York. Don't pull a Jason Takes Manhattan. And they don't get that close, no. even remotely. It still feels like New York, and there are some good like New York-ish set pieces. The entire climax, though, takes place in a fucking suburb. Like, you, once you've removed the subway, which the subway scene is probably top five scenes in the, in the whole thing. Yeah, classic New York setting of a yeah. cr- crowded subway. I loved all of the Easter egg costumes yeah. in the background. I was just, like, cringing waiting for Tara to turn to the Babadook that was on the train and be like, I love your Babadook costume. <laughs> <laughs> See, but once we're removed from that subway setting, we get into, like, a house, and it feels the same as all the other ones do. Well, and I'm not saying that they necessarily have to go to the Statue of Liberty or go to Times Square, but I would have liked to have seen some bigger, flashier New York set pieces. Ghostface just like running through the streets. The closest we get to like a public ghost face is the bodega, which I think which, is also another a fucking awesome scene. scene. So, and a lot of people complain about the whole gun thing. I I really like. I thought that same thing, but then I was like, wait. They have guns in the first one. Like Billy they all have guns, guns when they unmask yeah. at the end. Like, yeah. yeah, there's no reason he wouldn't, and he just picks it up because the store owner had it. Yeah, and uses it. But yeah, I thought they're just coming in and just fucking immediately stabbing the <laughs> shit out of people in this like well lit bodega, yeah. and then stalking them through the hallways. That was really tense. I love that this ghost face. You know, one of my favorite things about ghost face is that he she is always tripping over shit and getting hit by doors and all this this ghost face no this guy this one is like a fucking brutal tank who is just taking people out which i think i take people out i mean but still he doesn't know because gail i think but to me that made sense because gail is the most experienced of any of them (laughs) she could make him trip up but i also think that it it lends credence to the fact because there are three killers that we get three different people in different situations i think in the one of them is a cop so yeah yeah exactly in bodega we get the highly trained nypd detective mm-hmm. i mean that makes a ton of sense because like the like you like checking corners and doing all the things that police do it makes that ghost face knows that how to much handle a gun yeah brutal and terrifying because obviously that shit's a fucking shotgun if you have that fucking scrawny ass kid that's probably the one who gets his ass kicked by gail like you would have seen him handling shoot it a, fly across yeah the room. <laughs> handling a fucking shotgun <laughs> one-handed and then just blowing some dude's brains out like it's got to be fucking Dermot Maroney, fucking all big ass, <laughs> yeah, stocky little motherfucker. What one part of the movie that I found frustrating, and I guess this is kind of just mm-hmm. how slashers work, but it's still frustrating for me is we'll get these brutal kills, right? So like the first couple, I mean, the, they're just stabbing. I guess. The, well, I guess the first one doesn't count, but the other ones, like, there's a lot of brutality. The Samara and, one, I thought right off the bat was. But yeah, but we, but they're still not killing killer. anymore, yeah. right? Yeah. So, but th- we still get brutality from the actual killers, and then accuracy in a lot of ways but then when it comes to the people that we don't want to kill he's like oh i missed but i'm like okay and then same with mindy like why didn't you finish the job you finished the job with everybody else that you've attacked thoroughly so why are you like you pulled your punches you weren't sure she was dead like i don't know and that's just i mean that happens in slashers where they don't want to kill the main characters off and they want to add a little bit more tension, but it's like yeah, if the plot armor if the plot ways. armor is too like transparent, like you can see it, or you know, it's too noticeable, then it it, it gets annoying. And yeah. and if there's and there's there's a way to write it so that it makes sense. And I'm sure on rewatches, that's another thing too. Is I definitely like the the all of these opinions come from having only seen the movie once, and with all of the screen movies, like I'm gonna go back and watch this multiple times. And yeah, I'm sure, there are connections of who was the killer, and I've heard people say that it's a lot easier in this one than in other ones to tell who is the killer in which scenes. Oh, okay. Um, so I would be very interested to go back and watch it and go like, oh, that makes sense because this person was in this place, and that's why they're the less experienced killer. And obviously, like you said, Dermot being the one in the bodega makes a lot of sense. Um, and then any of them could be the one in the apartment because it's the sister. Well, I mean, besides the sister, yeah. so it could be the brother or Dermot. But to me, it seems like it's Dermot just because of how, again, just brutal 
Yeah. You know, you come down to the obvious, like, okay, well, the sister and the brother are, like, this tall. <laughs> and then Dermot's, like, this tall. And it's like, well, appa- apparently it's, like, Power Rangers magic or whatever, where when they, they morph into ghost face, they all grow up to be six feet tall and <laughs> giant. But I, I thought Roger Jackson did great. Yeah. I loved some of the lines. And, you know, we get some great one-liners. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I remember being like, okay, I see you, Ghostface. He's still got uh, it. Also, in the subway, somebody passes by with a Mojo Jojo costume on. I saw that, And yeah. I was curious if it was Roger Jackson in the costume. We don't see his face, but I'd be curious in, like, trivia or behind the scenes yeah. because, obviously, he voiced that character also. Uh-huh. So I was like, that's a little I Easter, didn't, yeah, I didn't Easter egg one. for Mojo Jojo. I was but. trying to pinpoint so many things. I thought some of the dialogue was a little eh. Like some of the writing, I was like, eh, that was well, kind of Well, it's not cheesy. Williamson. Yeah. It's not, it, it doesn't Still quite Still producer have the... on this, though, so that fool is just making money. <laughs> yeah, I mean, why not? Yeah. Yeah. I was a little bit disappointed that it was like, based off characters created by Kevin Williamson, totally. But I'm like, no, <laughs> shout out to Wes. Like, this is his baby. Yeah. Like, I feel like, all, like, you know, just out of respect. If it was me, I would always put his name on well, it. Well, our character named Wes got killed in the previous one. Yeah. So... <laughs> Um, but yeah, in terms of set pieces, I think this one has a few like standout ones that stand out above a lot of, I think that's what this is going to be remembered most for is like, Ooh, I loved the bodega. I loved the subway. I loved the ladder across the apartments. I do like that, you know, maybe part of the claustrophobic feel comes from the fact that, uh, living spaces in New York are so fucking living small spaces. that as opposed to having ghost face running around, like. Uh, fancy rich people residential homes and stuff we're having yeah. him run through tiny apartments i was also curious why the boyfriend didn't just run over like they live in the same complex or grab something and fucking chuck it through the window <laughs> yeah, yeah. like you're like, you're a brick shit house i liked how like weird and gentle that guy was <laughs> like he was a very you know he was they purposely made him like the least threatening person imaginable so that you wouldn't even really suspect him like he kind of wanders in and you go like do i suspect him no he just seems like a sweetheart like 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 uh jerry o'connell yeah (laughs) yeah very true um but a lot of people are fucking really digging digging this and at the end of the day that makes me really happy because it means that people still love scream and if you enjoyed this to like a four star five star level more power to you i wish that this had blown me away quite to that level um if i had to rank all of the movies um that would be a little bit difficult but what anything that you want to add Anything else? I mean, while I have while I have say while I have complaints, um, at the end of the day, like I said, it's still you know fun for those great moments, fun for the whole family. Yeah, and I think that those moments. I was sitting next. I was sitting next to like an eight year old kid throughout the entire movie. So I think that those moments are the parts that do show that this group. I don't know what what's that radio silence. Yeah, Mm -hmm. uh, that they are still just big fans of kevin and wes at the end of the day and that they are still while maybe a little misguided with some decisions are still taking to heart what was originally presented as their as the as the thing that they're you know expanding off of yeah it doesn't feel like sequels to halloween where at some point they've completely lost what made the original work like all of these movies feel like they still have that like core dna of like what makes scream work which is a charming group of young characters um the obviously the meta commentary stuff a little mix of humor and brutal kills the mystery Mystery. like it all that's a big one i think because we always know it's jason we always know it's michael i guess well i guess there's one time it's not actually jason or two times but we always know it's freddy right Mm -hmm. but then this is like who is it and so i think that adds a lot to it and because of that we get different styles like the fast (laughs) was something that these characters did that I don't think we got in the other ones. But I, the whole lot of time I was like, wipe the blade, man. <laughs> well, so we get one really cool wiping of the blade in Gail's apartment, and then we get the really cool the double, double wipe. Yeah. Where it's like the perfectly the synced killers. up. I, I mean, that got me a half chub. Too. Like, as soon as it happened, I was like, that's fucking cool. And we get a couple needle drops of red right hand. Yes. The girl oh, sitting next God. to me had a scream shirt on, and I could tell she was a big fan because she had like the little poster, which I unfortunately didn't get when I went in. They never offer him to me. I don't know if they're just like, he doesn't look that like That was supposed to be for the fan event. So, I, I still have my, my Scream 5 poster. Yeah, there. She must have just asked or whatever. But I could tell she was a big fan. And like simultaneously, we both like perked up out of our seats when Red Right Hand would come on. Because <laughs> yeah. you could tell we were both like, I get that reference. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm happy for everybody who's really enjoying this. And I think that the people who, you know, are calling it mid or whatever, they probably weren't big fans of the franchise to begin with. Because, yeah, I think Ghostface is, in some capacity, always going to do it for me. Um, and I just hope that if they continue making these year to year, that it doesn't turn into a saw or whatever, where they just keep getting more and more ridiculous. Like, don't rush. Uh, this one looks like it was geared up for an October release because it does take place on Halloween, on and around Halloween. I wanted and a I little bit like, more of that too. And I yeah. felt like this would have fucking killed in October, dude. <clears throat> what do you want when you, and you get into October? Scary movies. How about one based around Halloween? Well, I, I mean, it's not <laughs> really. Halloween's doing it, point it's, of it. it's not and it's not doing itself any disservice other than to people like us who are like oh i, I would have loved this in october well, i think it would have made a ton of money too not that it's i not. think that it's still going yeah. to make the same money or maybe more because it has less competition mm, right now by comparison yeah because what's because what's out now that 65 movie nobody gives a fuck about which that. is doing terribly like reviews yeah. wise and everything so. um you oh. know the only other thing that maybe might drum up a little business right now is the Oscar movies, and mm. at, I mean, and as of time of recording, and the, I mean, if you're watching or listening to this, you'll be seeing this the day after. Like that, that goes away once once the Oscars are done. There's a little buzz, but most of the stuff goes to home media, where you can watch it on streaming services or whatever, and it'll have its place in the sun for you know a few weeks, which I think it it's what it's going to get in October. But in October, it will have more competition from Horde. That's fair. Yeah. Well, uh, my only last comments were um, the uh, letterbox being your whole personality didn't hurt my feelings at all. <laughs> um, not even remotely. No, I, I, I laughed at it just because I was like, yep, that's me. I'm the problem. It's me. And um, also, it was nice to see the OG body snatchers on the TV at one yeah. point. Like I said, I was trying to figure out how that like factored into the plot. And the only thing I could think was that there were multiple people in ghost face masks and so it was like they're all the uh, who's the killer i don't know um but yeah i mean overall i had a good time i lucked out i bought my ticket like the the night before this came out and there were there was a big group that had bought out the seats on one side of the row and a big group that had bought out all the seats on the other side of the row and they had left a space assuming that they would have an empty space in the middle and i went nah bitch and i took that space right Dude. there and so i was in i went to dfx i was in the like the good front row where there's like a wall in front yeah right in the direct middle seat and i had an absolute blast and my crowd was great and not disruptive and yeah i had a kid next to me but the only part that was a little bit distracting was she got up at one point to go pee and was gone for like five minutes and it happened to be when like three characters in a row all got brutally stabbed and so she came back and was having to ask her mom like wait that person's dead wait that person's dead <laughs> and then at the end of course it's like no 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 sweetie none of them are dead because <laughs> <laughs> nobody dies in this movie except wow, for the killers wow, wow. but yeah i mean i'd recommend it um yeah. I, I don't know if we need to say that at this point because we said it at the beginning but um if you sat through this and you didn't see the movie um why why for do yeah there's some stuff that we missed so i mean like we could talk a, probably another half hour just about the ending alone the reveal and what happens with two of the core four and how that plays out yeah i think before i go more in depth i want to at least watch this one or two more times yeah. to really like solidify where this lands in my ranking because right now i'm like i don't know if i liked it as much as five mm -hmm. and but then you know on a rewatch this might go up as being you know better than that who knows so yeah. i mean really um, what do we want in a screen movie we want the meta stuff check mm -hmm. we want Ghostface, obviously which the tv show did not do <laughs> yeah <laughs> check right we want some brutal kills we got that and we got like this mystery with reveal like this movie does all the scream stuff it's funny it's you know has the horror and comedy built into it, it and some of that stuff really landed for me like, yeah agreed and I, so i think it checks all of the scream boxes also shout out to uh podcast representation because there's a podcast uh, last podcast on the again. left or whatever oh, poster yeah. on a uh, um jason's wall or whatever the uh, tony revelory in the beginning yeah so. yeah and so the references felt more like they applied more to me just like in the last one where she's talking about the babadook and hereditary and all that i was like cool now we're getting like my generation's horror references <laughs> in here um but yeah i had a good time on a rewatch maybe i'll come back with some more comments maybe we'll at some point before the end of the season do a quick like scream revisit or something and talk about how we feel about this movie but yeah any last thoughts from I you, James? Say about that. No, I think that that about oh. sums it up. Had a, <laughs> had a good time. Um, and I actually like it. 
Uh, she enjoyed it. She thought that it was predictable, but that that wasn't the point. Right. Okay. Fair enough. Cool. Well, yeah, again, we recommend it. And uh, next week we are going to be continuing with March Madness, and we are talking about Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. So check Thunderdome. that out. And uh, enjoy the Oscars if you haven't. And can't believe one best picture. <laughs> <laughs> Can you believe that got snubbed? That That's insane. Wild, yeah. Man. <laughs> All right. Thanks for watching and or listening. I've been Tone. I've been John. And I'll gut you like a fish. <laughs> Internet darling Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next time. Keep it creepy. <laughs>